Hey everyone, you're listening to the official podcast of 4PlayerNetwork.com. Check us out at that address for everything you need to know about our community, monthly giveaways, and nightly live streams. You can even support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash 4player. And last but not least, you can catch the live recordings of these podcasts every single Thursday night on our Twitch channel. We hope to see you there. Enjoy. Welcome to Four Player Podcast, episode 735. It's October 27th, 2022. It's almost Halloween. How's everybody feeling? Everybody feeling spooky? I was going to see if, everyone, if anybody wanted to dress up. I thought Brad usually does costume stuff on Halloween, but. Oh, would that have been this show, huh? I did, well, yeah. I mean, we can do it next week, too. I just didn't get any responses. <laughs> Nobody said anything. I was like, maybe I'm the only one feeling the Halloween spirit this year, which is pretty, well, un- I mean, pretty unusual. That's <laughs> not true. Brad usually goes all out. Like, I mean, I know you're recording in a, a different room, well, <laughs> but usually Nolan you have like. Is you... suddenly very spooky. Yeah, no, no, no one. Has... Oh yeah, I think no one went to go get a costume. He's gonna come back in two seconds and look different. Ah, uh, oh my god, what the fuck is that? That's, that's my face. <laughs> that's how dare you, Nick? That is Holy just shit. what Nolan looks like. Come on, man. Holy shit, that's horrifying. Actually, um. Cool. There we go. Oh God. Now I've like now what have I done? Now you, Brad's like done not, this. Brad's like, not to be topped, I will disappear and come back with a costume. I'm glad I brought this up. Um so anyways, yeah. Uh welcome everybody to the show. We got lots of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh I want to give a shout out to everybody who asked us a question for the pre show. Uh again, if you if if you haven't been paying attention, we've moved the community segment into the pre show. We record those at eight PM before we rec- <laughs> before we record the podcast. Um you can catch those on Twitch at twitch.tv slash four player podcast on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. before we record this this podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, so shout out to those people who ask questions. We got a lot of games to talk about tonight. Uh, and I'm joined. You, you have a lot of games to talk about tonight. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I'm here. I, I, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. actually um, this is actually uh, Henry's uh, uh, hat for from his Halloween costume. He's going to be a pirate and I, Griffin. Is going to be his parrot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There we go. That's good. That's what I was expecting. Okay. Uh, I still am trying to figure out what the hell Nolan is. I'm, I'm myself. He's himself. Okay. What are you talking about? I'm just All feeling right. a little under the weather, Nick. Uh, <laughs> creepy. Uh, I, I do watch. I do. Don't don't question my Halloween spirit. I do. I, I, I do to. think though. Once you have kids, you sort of channel your Halloween spirit through them. But I do still watch a lot of spooky stuff in October. I mean, to be fair, uh, if I hadn't if I hadn't quote unquote questioned your Halloween spirit, would you have gone and gotten this pirate hat that we're all now enjoying? Yeah, that's maybe true. Um, yeah, the you know what the worst part about having kids though. <laughs> the worst part about having kids is what. You see all these like cool, fun f- community functions, and then like millions of people go to them, and it's the worst. Like you can't have fun because there's too many people. I hate it. I hate. Yeah. It. I hate people. That's all. Mm. No. Yeah. No. I get it. Uh, I felt that way a little bit at uh, at Disneyland. <laughs> well, that's Disneyland. I know. Uh, no, the the cra- the the. Oh man! Every single ride. It, don't get me wrong. I had a blast at Disneyland, but every single like ride or attraction had this like pinned off area that was for strollers. And there was like strollers as far as the eye could see next to every <laughs> next to every attraction. I was like, I don't want any part of this. Um, well, I mean, you do, if you don't bring a stroller, you just have to carry a kid. And that's not good. Uh, I know. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not I, I, I'm not going to. I shouldn't say this because I don't have a child yet, so like this could obviously go out the window the moment I do have a child. But I was like, in my brain, in my in my non-parented brain, I'm like, if I have a child, I'm not gonna take that child to Disneyland until they are out, until they are past the stroller age. Although I don't really know what age that is because I have no idea how children work. Nah, but you're not you're not thinking correctly. Stroller yeah. just makes it easier when they when they can walk and they don't. They I mean. Kids suck at walking. They're bad at walking, and I'm not going to take my child to Disneyland until they're until they don't suck at walking. How's that? How's well, that? Well, I mean, 
they also just like get tired and they complain and they don't walk straight. Yeah, you don't even think about these things, but you know, your kid will just sometimes start walking in a diagonal away from you into the street and stuff, and that's not good. So yeah, it's bad. Or bad news. or they'll just take off running in a direction you have to go after them. Or they'll bolt. Yeah, they, they... Sonji and Chad says that's why you get not toddler bad. leashes. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways this is not a parenting podcast we're actually here to talk about video games as we usually do um and there's a lot of stuff to talk about this week of course i want to start with kind of the newer stuff there's two pretty big releases (laughs) my wife just got home um two big releases to talk about we're gonna talk about a plague tale requiem and mario plus rabbit sparks of hope those are kind of the two big ones I don't really know what we're going to start with. Any any preferences here? I think Brad Brad's the only person who played Mario plus Rabbit. So why don't we why don't we open with a Plague Tale? I think Chris Davis and myself are the only people who have played a Plague Tale so far. I know Nolan, you've been you have not played Plague Tale, and I'm pretty sure Brad hasn't either. Even though Brad does have Game Pass, not... I I really hope y'all get to it. If if you play the original, I did see Chris Davis's um comment on twitter today he just couldn't just couldn't contain himself until i gotta be honest i was thinking about playing this one even though i had not finished the first game until i realized that i looked at reviews and i was like oh well this is just kind of like the first game but more of what people liked and that's the story and i guess if i'm not invested in the story i probably shouldn't play this game i do no i can't really so i played a plague tale innocence and i a lot i played a all the way through. I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it for its story and for its mechanics, but probably more so for its story. I do think this game finds it strikes a much better balance between mm-hmm. story and gameplay because they've, I mean, I'm not nearly, I mean, Chris Davis finished it. So I'm only like, I'm on chapter like five, I think maybe I've played it for like seven hours or something like that. Um, it's, a, it feels like a much bigger game. In fact, what's kind of crazy about this game is that I don't usually associate Focus Home Entertainment, which is the publisher, and a Sobo with like getting these like huge budgets. Um, in fact, I don't really associate games with this level of polish with Focus Home Entertainment. And I don't necessarily mean that to be a huge knock on Focus Home Entertainment. It's just kind of they've made their name publishing a lot of like you know um, kind of uh, Eurojank RPGs, which I love, and. Um, I mean, Just when you think budget, of Focus but... Entertainment, the, the first thing that comes to your mind is Farming Simulator. Like, what well, is that? That's not the first thing that comes to my mind. But yes, I can see how <laughs> that might be. I mean, they always have a, they always had a really big presence at E3, and I always liked going to their booth and seeing the games they had. But they were always like like kind of weird, experimental, uh, smaller budget games like The Surge. Uh, uh, Gloomwood, uh, just all kinds of stuff in that same vein. So I really and Plague Tale fell into that. Fell into You're that. Saying bucket. they finally made a game pretty enough for you, Nick. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. No, no, no. But <laughs> in all seriousness, <laughs> in all seriousness, this game feels. <laughs> You've kind of trapped me into saying into into like <laughs> clarif- verifying what you just said, Brad. I didn't, and I hate you for it. This, no, no, it. no, your, your way out is just call it atmosphere. I mean, the first game had atmosphere too, but this game definitely feels like it got a significant increase in budget and they, it feel, it plays so much smoother. I mean, I think, you could also game. say that this is not an original game. So obviously the first one did fairly well and right. they were able to it's learn not a new lessons IP. from the first game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So that, that you know, you could generally, for the most part, when a game is successful, its sequel generally isn't like worse uh, significantly, right. it, at least in terms of like you know graphics, game design, stuff like that. Yeah, right. It's just I do feel like, and, and maybe that's just kind of like the blinders from like ha- not having played the original in a while, but like to me, it feels like there's a pretty significant jump from the first one to, to this one, um, from a technical standpoint, from a mechanical yeah. standpoint. From a design standpoint, also just the fact that it's like it's it's quite long. How long did it take you to finish this game? Uh, I want to say about eighteen hours. Yeah, I, I like I was kind of expecting this to be like a five or six hour romp and then be over, which I think is kind of what the first one was, if I remember correctly. Maybe I'm underselling it just a little. It bit. It was longer than that. It was um, a little longer. 
it, I mean, it was it was a much more linear game back then, but it, it wasn't like six or so hours. And this game is pretty linear. I mean, like this definitely is not like an open world game. It, it's guiding you through a story, but like all of the levels they take Please. you through are significantly larger and like more complex. And the leads, first half leads... of the game is fairly linear. Um, the second half is when it starts to experiment and open up. Are you serious? Like it opens up in the back half of this game? Yes. The, oh, the average completion me. time for Plague Tale Innocence with main story plus some side stuff is 12 and a half hours. It wasn't short. Yeah. I mean, it depends on who you ask. Like, for some people, 12 hours is short. For some, like, I'm just saying 18 to 20 hours on a game like this is a pretty big jump from a game that's 10 to 12 hours before. It, it, it yeah. feels well, a lot. Let me ask you this. Does this. Is this a game that feels like it benefits from being longer? Like, is yes. it that type of game? Yes. I can only, co- I will say this. I can only comment on like those first six hours or so. Uh, and my answer to that would be undoubtedly yes. Um, I also do know because the drunken merchant, you know, community member at discord.gg slash four player is obviously been very, very excited for this. And he did, a, he, he, he posted a little like, here are my pros and cons review kind of, of, of this game. And he has been like ecstatic about this game, loves it. And he, one of his cons was he does feel like it's maybe a bit too long. So I don't know if maybe it starts to kind of wear out as welcome at some point, but yeah, like, I mean that, le- that, that, that very thing was one of like some people's like big complaint with the last of us too, where like the first game was like, you know, whatever, 12 hours or whatever. And then the second game was like twice as long, you know, some people yeah, about 30 hours d- um, does, again, does plague tell Requiem have enough like verbs or whatever to kind of keep that interesting for 20 hours. Yes. Um, they, they, I- greatly expand the uh, uh, types of encounters you can have between guards, rats, and both at the same time. The areas are much larger when it comes to stealth or combat, and and you have a lot more options as to uh, going through areas. Fun. It's pretty fun trying to, like, suss your way through these environments, because they're there's, almost like big puzzles. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot better exploration this time around. Um, the rewards are, are much for? more substantial. What are you looking for? Uh, so, the most common so stuff I, is a uh, uh, loot that to upgrade your equipment. Um, hmm. But there's also like hidden puzzles in the game that will unlock like permanent buffs for you. Hmm. So, and and perhaps maybe the most I think the most interesting change from a design gameplay design or just a game design standpoint I think from the first one to this one is they've introduced a system for up for like leveling up your character and learning new like attributes or skills for your character that is literally tied to um I don't I don't know what the technical term for this is but it's like when you do something it go the points in that it's kind of like is it like is it Elder Scrolls I'm thinking of where it's like if you if you w- bypass an enemy without harming him, you like you have three skills. You have it's like prudence, aggression, and I forgot what the third one was. Opportunistic, uh, I think. Opportunistic. So like if if you're if you're using the if you're leveraging the environment um, to take down enemies, um, I think it's gonna like put it's gonna naturally just start putting points and filling up this bar as opportunistic. If you're, if you, for every enemy that you sneak past without harming, it puts points into prudence. And along those bars, they have little, they have uh, like milestones that unlock attributes. So it's like, if I sneak past enough enemies, I will unlock the skill that lets me make less noise when I'm, when I'm creeping around. So it's kind of, it's rewarding you for choosing a particular play style and, and, and do, just doing that without having to actually think about what I'm going to put points into. But it does have other things, like like you said, you're finding tools and and stuff in the environment that lets you upgrade like the physical parts of your your pouch um, and your alchemy stuff for like making slings and and elemental attacks and stuff like that. So you're still physically upgrading stuff, but at the same time, you're just kind of organically upgrading by just playing mm-hmm. the way you want to play the game. Yeah, and I, 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 I do want to I do want to mention this because I, it became kind of a thing in Discord this past week. I, I ran into a bit of a wall, and I'm still kind of pissed about this. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, I know, but like I got past it, and I'm totally. I, I've at this point, I've I've forgotten about it. I don't really care anymore. But like, there was a point where I was sitting to, thinking to myself, like they've they've prepped me at this point for like, okay, if you want to place, if you want to play this game stealthily, you want to put all your points into prudence, you can do that. 
So I'm sitting here trying to get through this area without taking any guards down. And towards the end of this area, there's this story beat where this like these guards are taking this this they capture this guy who's an herbalist and they're walk they're walking him through this town, right? And this objective marker pops up and it says save the herbalist, right? And I'm like, okay, save the herbalist. I got to save I got to save this guy. And I'm also trying not to kill anybody. And it became apparent to me that there's no way to save this guy. Absolutely no way. I thought I thought I was just doing something wrong. I spent like an hour beating my head against the wall. Like, what am I doing? Like, how the fuck do you save this guy? Until people in Discord were finally like, dude, stop. You can't save him. You <laughs> literally can't save him. And I was like, then why the fuck did they put an objective marker on the screen that told me to try and save him? And if, if that hadn't been up there, I would have just kind of accepted it as like, oh, that's a story beat. That's going to happen no matter what you do. Don't worry about it. But like that shit really grinds my gears. But like I was trying to play stealthily, and I I couldn't do I could not save the herbalist without trying to kill everybody in the fucking area. And I was like, so these things are like kind of counterintuitive, and it was really pissing me off. Yeah. But ever, that... ever since I got past that point and I like moved on, I haven't had any more issues like that. I'm totally I'm kind of smitten with this game at this point. So yeah, y'all and... can sleep well at night. <laughs> And to to the game's credit, that could easily be fixed by simply changing the objective pop up from save the herbalist to try to save the herbalist. Yeah, that's what I said. Just um, use the word try, damn it. I, I tried. Yeah. I tried to save him. I couldn't do it. I don't think that uh, solves the problem either. Well, it's but, still giving you the impression that it's something that you could maybe do. Yeah. I mean, you, you can I, try, but and it's also technically you actually can save him. I was able I to do to it, but the, it took me a while to do it. I don't need oh, to hear this technically. Wow, crap, you're but like, a scrub, but saving him didn't give you anything, right? Chris no, like no, the, the, the game dialogue. does not, the programming for the game does not account for the possibility of you actually saving him. Um, if you do that, he will just wow. stand there and not say anything. So I do want to point out the reason why I was so like dead set on trying to save this guy. And this is me being like, okay, how far did they improve this game over the first long? Like, how deep does the rabbit hole go now? Like, is this game that much better? Rabbit hole, please. That, like, and, and also, um, I forgot who it was. Somebody in Discord said something about, like, characters in this game, like, the amount of characters they introduce and, like, is, is, is wild and stuff. And I was, like, thinking to myself, like, so if I save this herbalist, does he, like, go back to my, like, town or whatever and become part of my base camp? And then, like, I can unlock dialogue and it's, like, it unlocks stuff that I would, otherwise he wouldn't be there. And it turns out I was giving the game a little too much credit. It doesn't do that. Um, so I was a little bummed out about that. But not not to worry, because everything else around this game is pretty fucking rad. And I can assure what? you that no other point rad. in this game has a questionable moment like that. The rest of yeah, it's pretty I mean, much smooth sailing as far as telling you exactly what you probably should be doing. All I, I have one question for you, Chris Davis. Fire away. I like that first game a lot. But that ending. Um, what do you remember that of that oh, ending? First off, the no, rat poop or I, whatever the. F <laughs> yeah, I had I mean? no idea until recently. Someone spoiled it on a podcast, and I remember you not liking the ending. But I thought the ending was just some tough fight or whatever. But no, it was like really like stupid, and that's why yeah. you didn't like it because yeah. you don't like stupid stuff. Well, no, I, I mean, I, it's mostly. <laughs> it's not that I. First of all, it's not necessarily as cut and dry as I don't like stupid stuff. It's just. They spend a they spend an entire game telling you this pretty dramatic, intense, kind of like serious. I mean, I know it's kind of silly. I mean, it it is inherently silly. It's all supernatural. The rats thing is obviously exaggerated to the nth degree or whatever. But like, it's telling you this pretty character centric. It's like if you played the entirety of The Last of Us, and then at the very end, like the, you fist like, fight the Pope. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, you do that. Yes. And you and, and uh, you love the story in Assassin's Creed too. Uh, you know, I don't. <laughs> that is the first time I remember being like, why? Why are these? Why are there's like so many games that have like the Pope is like the like the villain at the end of the game? Think and, about to be fair, it. I mean, the Pope yeah. is not really the villain at the end of a Plague Tale, but it's like a, this crazy religious guy that dresses kind of like it's, the Pope. So. It's the the French Inquisition's leader. Yes, is um, the, is and he and he controls a huge tornado of rats. Um, and yeah. so do and you, it, right? And you're having like a rat battle. Yeah, oh. you're having a <laughs> you're having a rat battle. 
I mean, you are. Yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly yeah. what happens. But all, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, oh, he has, he some... has white rats. He has yes. white rats, and you have regular brown rats, and you yes. are fighting a rat battle. There, there it, is it, a story a reason tornado. for that. I mean, oh, I, there's co- okay. there's story connections. I'm there's, sorry, it's, there are story it's... connections for why that happens. An okay, entire arc quick. of the story revolves has consequences that lead sure. to what that battle is. Okay, um, of course, natives. of course. But, but my point to try is to answer your question, Nick, well, no, real, real, real there quick. is nothing like that in this game. Okay, that's good. But real quick, I just hey, want to point out that's my disappointing. Only, my like they spend a, a this game has amazing characters and amazing voice acting and amazing performances that I take very serious. Like I care about these characters. I care about their relationships. It's very like somebody in chat when I was, I was streaming this the other night and someone had was little, I think it was funky duck. Maybe came into chat. and He was like, I've never, I've never heard of this game or whatever. And people were trying to explain. I was like, you haven't heard of a plague tale. And they're like trying to tell him what a plague tale is. And he's like, watch me play. And he's like, so this is like the last of us with rats. And I was like, the rats, you know, that's not entire. That's not entirely unfounded. Like it is a game about the relationship between the two main characters, and mm-hmm. it is a very, even though it is obviously kind of exaggerated and over the top, uh, like stuff happening around them. The game, the drive of the game, is the relationship between this brother and this sister, and this, you play you play as a sister, and she wants to protect her brother, and I care about those characters, and they do a really good job of selling me on these characters, and like, so then all of a sudden to thrust you into this position where you're like having a rat battle with the Pope, it really just kind of broke it for me at the end of the first game. And I'm, I was like, and I'm liking this game enough that I'm like, oh, fuck, please tell me that this doesn't take a, a hard left turn at the end of like the first I mean, game. So, I, so I don't want to have to I also say... I don't entirely trust Chris Davis. <laughs> you know, one of the well, one, one of my barriers is I don't, I don't want this to sound too offensive. But, but it's going to. <laughs> I feel like I have a harder time empathizing with people who have French accents. <laughs> no, Bra- Brad's right. Brad's right. What the fuck? I'm just kidding. Right. Go. We, we can we can cut For it a little bit. You know what I'm saying, right? No one gets it. I I don't want to cut it because there's things I want to say. I'm just oh, kidding. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, oh, go ahead. I just go ahead, Chris Davis. Where do you want to go next? This is probably my game of the year at this point. Wow. Um, the 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 story fucking delivers for me. The performances of the characters are excellent. Nick, you haven't even gotten to like the really big just draw dropping. Uh, it just you're you oh, cry believe- at the end of this game. Uh, the the journey you go on with these characters. Um, That's what I like to hear. The the everything like I, like I was saying, everything in this game is an escalation from the first. The the combat encounters and exploration, um, the nice. variety of puzzles and everything you see along the way is just dramatically increased. Uh, they logically increase the 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 rats to an even greater threat. Like Nick, where you are in the story, you're you're on chapter five, right? Don't quote me on that. Something oh. I got there last night. I'm sneaking through. It's nighttime. Oh, I'm trying to get to Joseph on the boat. Okay, and I'm sneaking right. through that area where they're burning the bodies and stuff. Well, um, hey, everything escalates, but then you say there's nothing cool like a rat tornado in this one. Dude, oh, dude, God. Dude, no, there, there's there's not rat tornadoes, Brad. They're rat tidal waves. Dude, no, no it, the the rat stuff is like obviously ridiculous, but you, like you, that's kind of the game's hook, and they definitely use that. You gotta understand. Effect. They they built up this tech specifically around rats in this game. The first game uh, could render five thousand rats in a scene. In this sequel, it can render three hundred thousand. Um, That's pretty bananas. And they it's... use that to its logical extent uh, because there, like I said, there are rat tidal waves. Um, they also like uh, they do a really good job of kind of like slowly leading to the the introduction of the rats like actually if you're watching the footage now you can just see them come out of the ground here um but like that like for the first hour this happens when when stuff like that happens are they more like scripted sequences we are um, like running away from rats and stuff or, I mean, or is that, it more like there, dynamic in terms of systemic there's towards the end there's some systemic portions of that stuff 
but a lot of like the really, really, really big rat moments are kind of scripted. I mean, um, most a lot of this game is scripted. The, the, the thing yeah. is, there's a lot of the stuff in this game is scripted, but it's happening in bigger, more complex areas. So there's you're not being funneled as as like directly. Like you're not spending a ton of time feeling like you're being forced down a hallway. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. you, you don't feel like you strictly have to go from directly from A to B to C. Um, there's there's a lot more because of the tools that they uh, allow you in this game and the upgrades you can do. There's a lot of uh, new variety through to traversal uh new tools for f- figuring ways out through areas um it, I mean, it a lot really of it does... has to do with with you know they give you the ability to like add um like pow like use this powder to like snuff out flames they give you the ability to like use tar to like cause these big like kind of reactive explosions uh when you when introduced to flames and stuff they give you pots that you can like fill with stuff and and throw to have different effects um like th- and they give you like um they give you kind of like what we were talking about with the Resident Evil 1 remake they introduce these like one use items kind of actually kind of like shivs in um in the Last of Us 2 where you have you know they give you these one use knives and like they have enemies like guards that run around if the guard is wearing a helmet cuz the only way to kill enemies in this game is really is to hit them with a direct hit to their their head with a rock yeah that um, that was that was one of the hel- biggest crutches in Innocence was that most of the guards uh, didn't have helmets on. Uh, yeah. So you, you could really just run around and just kill them all which pretty felt easily. Kind of, which felt kind of also unrealistic. Like what kind of, what guard is not going to be art, yeah. like sh- wearing a Maybe helmet of some kind. It. But that's so the like, first thing are, they address in this game. Yeah. So there's a lot of guards that you can't just resort to hitting them in the head with rocks. So you have to find ways to uh, other way, other ways to take them down or you can, and they also give you the ability, like, if you get knocked down, in a fight, like if, if someone catches you, they they'll come up to you and they'll like push you to the ground, and you have a second to like counter them. Or, and then you at, once you like stun them, you can pull out a knife if you have one in your inventory and shank them and kill them. But yeah, the, the, the first game didn't have any melee to it whatsoever. So it oh. definitely kind of like makes the combat feel. It's kind of like going from the Last of Us One to the Last of Us Two, where the combat feels way more dynamic. There's a lot more happening. It's a lot more complex. Um, hmm. And that stuff's fun. Chris, it's all fun. Chris Davis, do you get a sword? You do not get a sword in this game. In fact, in the trailer, she she picks up the very end of like a cinematic trailer or something. She picks up a sword and I'm like, man, that'd be nice if there's like sword combat in this. Because I was like super bored playing the first game. I want a sword. There's melee combat, but there's not with a sword. Um, In fact, there was a moment last night when I was streaming where she literally finds a sword in like a in like a warehouse. And she's like, but she's like. She's also looking for her sling, which had been taken. So she's like, she's like, ooh, a sword. Where's my sling? And she just like walks past. <laughs> and I was like, this, this bitch just like literally just ignored the sword. But then somebody in chat made a good point. If you don't know how to use a sword, it's better off just not trying, not trying to use it. I feel like you're probably mm, gonna disagree. Mm. Well, I whatever, mean, Brad. They they address that it, this particular thing we're talking about right now in the story. They talk about mm. it. So like, Stop there's it. narrative implications. Stop for it. Reason. You can write any excuse around mechanics you don't want to do. I, that, do, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. I want a sword. She picked up hey. a sword in the trailer, and I thought it was hype. Well, Now you're telling me Brad. she doesn't use a sword? She gets the something sling better. Is... <clears throat> oh, okay. <laughs> um, I also want to point out Vincent Graves in chat. I, I didn't mean to draw a actual direct comparison to The Last of Us from The Last of Us to The Last of Us Part or comparison between a plague tale and the last of us part two all i'm saying is there is a similar escalation in like combat dynamics from the last of us part one to two that is kind of similar from innocence to requiem here i mean it's the first thing i think about when, when i see these games and they're picking up all these like resources and like craft and stuff on the fly it's very last of us yeah i mean there's <clears> definitely <throat> inspiration there for sure yeah um but we should probably move on. Is there anything else? I know this is like your game of the year so far, Chris Davis. So anything it's, that we haven't mentioned? I don't believe you. Brad, you like yeah. this more than Elden Ring? Yes. Oh! oh fucker. <laughs> I like Elden Ring. It's a really good game. This is better. Wow. Damn. How, I, how is that possible? <laughs> it's, it's easy. Also, Nick, for your benefit, you'll really like to know this. The game has a really good photo mode. And oh, I know. I've been taking lots of photos. Oh, you have <laughs> He's been you, photoing you don't know about rats the best and naming them. You don't know about the best part, though. The photo mode works in the middle of cinematics. Oh, no, I know that. Oh, I know. <laughs> I've been taking them. 
It's it's. I, I'm, I just I'm on top of it, Chris Davis. Things. Yeah. No, I mean and that's also not necessarily unheard of. With photo, like a lot of the best photo modes let you do that shit. Last of Us, Horizon, both of those games let you do that in. Yeah. But it's really in this. Who is this? I. Okay, we need. We really need one. We're half hour in, but yeah. I, when we get to game of the year discussions, you're gonna have to sell me on this a little harder because I just I don't. I don't. Uh... Hey, Brad. You know, you know what's great though? This game is on Game Pass. It yeah, costs you, you could play it right now. Try it. Yeah, but try you know, it I, I don't. I mean, I got other stuff to play, right? You know, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I got All other right. stuff to play, Nick. Yeah, believe me, I know. I am right there Nick, with you. I, I got other transition. stuff to play. Oh shit, Brad! Like, what are you playing? Sorry. <laughs> oh hey, God damn um, it. I'm playing Mario Plus Rabbids uh, Sparks of Sparks Hope, Hope, which is the sequel to Kingdom Battle, uh, which came out in 2017. It's been five years. Oh, so here's the thing, right? What took the the rats people? so long what took the rabbits people so long you know they, like they both took a god of war amount of time to make their sequels and that doesn't make sense to me uh well first of all development is hard brad <laughs> it, meaning like, yeah, serious business are very team, hard team size team size makes a difference um budget makes a difference and <clears throat> uh you know it's also about scope of the project different i don't know like, you know, so, you, you talked about God of War Ragnarok previews and people being like, it's kind of similar to God of War 1. I feel like... Five game, years like, should be a, a long time to make a... Or I think God of War is also, even longer than that. Also, maybe, maybe the sequel wasn't greenlit immediately. What? Of God maybe of War? they didn't... Oh, no, 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 this? About this. Like, maybe they didn't oh, actually get the green this light. This did really start. well. This did really well because it was launch here for Switch. I'm actually surprised. Oh, let's... Okay, well, let's talk about it. This yeah. is uh, Mario and Rabbids 2. Uh, sequel five years in the making. I was a little disappointed when I heard it was just another Mario and Rabbids game. I liked that first game a lot. It made my top ten list. It's Mario, XCOM, it's fun. But, you know, when that came out, the dream was always, ooh, what other crossovers could they do? Give us mm -hmm. Zelda XCOM or Metroid XCOM, you know? And you kind of... I don't know. You know, they did a big DLC expansion for the first game where they brought in, like, Donkey Kong and... And um and and whatnot and introduce some new mechanics and stuff. It, so to see such a big period of time pass and five years and have it just be like, hey, it's another one of these Mario and Rabbids games. And I am not super far in this game, so a lot of this is gonna have to be, you know, taken with a grain of salt. But like, it's <laughs> I feel like they added they added like a new rabid guy, which you'll see he's very like emo and has like a Buster Sword. And oh. they they added um, Bowser, and I'm like, motherfucker! This was like five years. I, that should there should be like dozens of characters or something. This seems like it seems like not enough of that stuff because like the whole series is kind of built on like or you know it's a crossover, right? It's built on like fan service, like you these characters. Oh, I get to see Mario with a gun. Let's what other characters? Like why can't I be Toad and and Daisy and, and and like there should be words. more there should be more, I feel like. Um in terms of like that sort Waiting of stuff, for a right? Because here. I, I want to see what Toad does with the with a gun, right? Or or a I hammer. I don't know. I don't know. It just seems even even like the characters that are returning are even I feel like even they have like very also, similar move sets and stuff like Luigi is still the sniper, you know, and holy shit, Brad. Also, COVID, man, we just like completely glazed over the fact that COVID happened in the middle of that five year period. What? Stop it. Stop also, it. Also, they I mean, did get stuck working on a large amount of time on that Ghost Recon game. What? Mm, this yeah, developer? The, yeah. The Spark, the Mario and Rabbids people also do Ghost Recon? Yeah, they worked on Breakpoint. They got to be different teams. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I know COVID's a thing. I'm just saying with any 
there are still sequels that are doing like fancy shit, right? I mean, he's talking about the rat game doing fancy shit now. Um, and I guess this is doing fancy shit, right? It, it, again, I'm not far enough to know the well, extent of how different, different it, it is. It does, it does a little feel a little different. I mean, the zones that you're exploring feel a lot more open ended. You know, you're like finding little side quests and you're kind of running around back and forth and finding like secrets and stuff. And now, like the first one was pretty linear and you were getting it and like the, the the combat encounters were like scripted right like when you ran into a combat encounter because it's because this is the point where this combat encounter happens in this place and that's cool and all now they're almost like random encounters where like you'll run into like a little goomba just out in the field and when you run into them you get transported to like the battlefield basically it's like, oh, and you're like kind RPG. of like a little mini right battle um where it just might be like a few enemies and you kind of get through it pretty quick and then you're back out into the world um kind of exploring it and in the world you're doing like little puzzles and riddles and stuff kind of like the first game had honestly um but here it's a little more open-ended a little more side questy feeling like you might talk to an npc and it's like hey come back when you do this thing and i got this other thing for you you know it's it's very side questy but it's still very <clears throat> it, it definitely feels like kind of iterative in terms of the way that that's built out. Um, this almost feels like this design almost feels a little more like predictable. Like I, I feel like this sort of like open ended design feels like more what you expect out of out of a video game. While the first Mario Rabbids, it was like kind of weird, like how it was structured um, almost um i think it was but, maybe they the, the first one had a smaller budget because it was obviously they were, they were taking maybe a bigger risk like because i didn't know yeah. if like, that, that combination was going to be particularly popular or successful so they didn't take a lot of risks with it i mean i almost wish anyways. wish they went more like in the in the direction of xcom and kind of made it a little more systemic right like xcom is and a little but but whatever i mean let me say like the first time when i turned this on i was surprised by how much immediately brought me back to the f how weird it is that you're 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 playing a mario game and you're controlling a character who looks like mario and it's bright and colorful and you expect to be able to like run and jump around but you can't you you can't jump at all you're just I, locked to the ground I would, and, I would and it argue doesn't you're not playing a mario game you're playing a game that has mario in it yeah you're right but it looks like a mario platformer at a glance sure. so there's so there's like this weird like mental thing of like this looks bright and colorful and like it should play like a fun mario game but it doesn't feel good to really to move around the world. I think there there's some improvements there, but all you have is like this little sprint, which is even of itself is awkward, right? Like it's the top, you know, face button of that diamond. You have to hold it mm. down to sprint. And it's like, that's not even a good place to put a sprint button. And you can go in the menu and change it to a toggle, right? Sure. I was like, of course I want to do that. I don't want to hold down the the top button of my face buttons but the toggle turns on like an auto run and i'm like why that's not the way to handle this i don't mm -hmm. and then you're like running into walls and then they just stop and fall on their butt when they run into walls it just i i, I have weird. this weird sinking suspicion that nintendo is like you can't make this feel good you you can't make a game where you run and jump around as Mario and have it feel better than one of our Mario games. So he's not allowed to jump, you know, it's just, you're it saying they, they took Mario plus rabbits out at the knees because they didn't want it to feel better. I than don't know. Mario maybe. Games. I mean, it looks nice. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's a little bit too conspiracy, but, but it, it, it's, too? it's just strange that Mario can't jump, but he can jump in battle. They do have some, some new mechanics there. This glide mechanic where you were able to like bounce off of uh, your teammates and stuff in the last one to kind of get, to further vantage points or places. Um, but now you can like, everyone can glide through the air after they boost off of, off of your teammate, which gives you some more like mobility options. Like Mario can be upgraded to like be able to shoot in the air and to be able, when he bounces, he can start another glide if you invest into those skills. And it seems like you can get pretty crazy and powerful with some of these mechanics, like moving around, um, but you know, you know, it's like an XCOM game, right? But they give you a lot more freedom to kind of move around more freely and do a lot of things before you actually take your 
the action points of your turn, right? So so mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to kind of set up these things where you're getting one character into position, switching to another character and to to set up a like a like a bounce off glide, but like, oh, that's actually not good position. So I'm gonna switch back to that character, move them a little bit more to the right, and then and then set up, you know, like you have a lot of freedom to do all that stuff. And then you still have a lot of like control to like move like until you shoot your gun or whatever or your rockets or whatever, you can do so much. And that's that feels a lot different than the first game. But you know how Would you I say, say this, this feels like like kind of the game you wish maybe they had made the first time around? No, 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 no. I, I, don't, I don't think that's at all. I mean, I was, I was really like satisfied with that first game and, and I thought it was quite fun. This, this feels like, like more of that in some ways. But, but remember how I said you, you go into these like little bite sized random encounters. Um, there's something, little off about that and again i know i'm early in the game so i i know that stuff's going to get longer but the the whole idea of a random encounter is you don't want them to be really long because you could be doing a lot of them. like i get into a sequence later that you might see in the footage where it's almost like it's a secret area that is it, it kind of looks like a captain toad treasure tracker level or whatever um and and it's almost I like a little idea. stealthy right where there's there's a enemies walking around and and you can kind of like sneak around them but when you get into a fight it's like a random battle but when you get into those random battles they're the short little XCOM fights right but when you're only fighting like three four five enemies i feel like you're not building like a narrative for that combat encounter and i feel like a memorable combat encounter in like a tactical game like a good XCOM game is kind of you have to like build moments in that fight for it to like really stand out in your mind when it's like this really short snappy thing it's like well that was almost like nothing it was disposable i'm never going to remember that combat encounter ever again but when you play like XCOM, you will remember like every combat encounter because like there's a narrative there it's long it's meaningful there's ups there's downs that that's not happening here now it's a it journey. could happen with it's a journey. It could happen with like boss fights and there are like kind of puzzling encounters, which are cool, but I feel I f I'm finding myself somewhat disappointed by some of these more quicker disposable encounters, which I understand why they do that, but I don't know. I like a good, meaningful, you know, memorable story to each of my combat. You're still encounters. Pretty early, right? and, and, and the first game like, had more of that because they were these longer scripted encounters. So um, do, you, do you feel like that that could that dynamic could change over the course of the game? You're still pretty early. Maybe, right? like, maybe, maybe. But but remember, structurally, since they're the, not, every encounter is not like the scripted thing that happens in the world, they're d d d they don't want them to be long. Like they, I don't see why they would want a a random encounter to be long because then that sort of breaks the flow of exploring that world. So I think they're. It's going to get more interesting, and they're going to come up with with new like enemy types and little twists. I mean, the first game was really good at that, and I'm already seeing sort of that like like hints at that, and that's exciting. But I was just surprised how that change actually kind of had more of an effect on me than I thought it would. Um, one thing that that's weird, w w little weird in this one is they they've added voice acting, but hmm. it's so weird and inconsistent and sporadic so you have your little robot guy that you're actually controlling and following around which is probably the excuse for why you don't actually jump because you're controlling a floating puck and not mario but hey he is voice acted now and he's like the person who comments on the things in the world so you're getting a lot of you know british robot from that guy but then the rabbits kind of talk or the rabbits kind of talk but yeah. not like full lines they'll say like little tiny parts of the phrase or maybe like a catchphrase and then like there's like peach who will say like nothing right because they're mario characters so you have this very awkward like well this character talks and this character kind of does blips and this character doesn't talk at all and this character saying only part of what it's very strange and i kind of wish they would just commit and it, that might have something to do with nintendo as well that they don't want this to be a fully voiced i mean they they don't want peach having full conversations right you save that for anya taylor joy or whatever right i don't know yeah. it, it's it's strange and it kind of makes it feel more budget in a way even though at the same time they've added more at voice acting than the first game if that makes any sense it just feels awkward now yeah. which is interesting okay, um so but you, I, you know done... i feel like i'm kind of down on it but but the first game i feel like took me a little while to really see like oh this is this is this they put a lot in here and this is well made and it gets challenging and and here 
there, there's I'm there's difficulty settings now, and I'm playing on hard, and I feel like I'm taking a lot of damage. But then you know how I told you there's random encounters with like Goombas. They have like levels, so like when I run into like a level. 10 combat encounter and i'm only level seven then i'm just taking way a lot of damage from enemies and it feels like i can get through this but it's it's not it, it may be feel like i feel like i always want like a tactical way out of a t- tense situation and it's not kind of like the same well thing that happened with assassin's creed where like yeah a little bit a little bit maybe not quite to that extent but yeah but like it it, it makes you it kind of it make it like it's satisfying in some ways but on the other end it, it it makes it feel like you can't just get you can't just get better at it to get out yeah. of the situation it's like you know, the numbers taint the kind of like your expectation of a fight before you even go into it I don't know if it happens in this footage or maybe when I was playing like right after the footage, but this might give you an example of what I meant by like a narrative. Like I had a combat encounter where I, w- I went into like a fight that I was probably like, I don't know, under leveled for. That's weird to say, but hey, um, I guess I was under level four. And like I like Peach and Mario got like just wrecked right away by like a big dude. They just died. And I have no way of bringing them back. That might be a hard mode thing. So it's just Luigi. And like a whole battlefield of enemies and he's a sniper and I'm like slowly like picking them off. I'm going into overwatch, you know, kind of it. And it's like the battle lasted a lot longer because I was like instantly put on my back foot. Right. But like now that battle, that combat encounter, even though it was kind of like a flub and I probably should have just restarted because, you know, normally I wouldn't play that way because it was just instantly a train wreck. Um, I should just come back to this fight later. I ended up like winning the fight and it was, it was a cool moment for like the sniper kind of hold up. Right. Uh, and it just happened to be Luigi. This is what I want from like a tactics game. I want something, you know, lengthy and meaty enough to like be memorable. And that was almost kind of like an accident, but, um, can I, can I, ask I have about the, I, the random encounters real quick? Yeah. So yeah. like what I, I've been watching your footage and you fought two of them so far in the span of 15 minutes. Like, as far as I can tell that there's no rewards for actually doing these, what is the incentive no, no, no. You, to get you, into you, you get You get money and star bits. I mean, there's a lot of like RPG systems here. They have the skill trees like the first game, but now a lot of your rewards that you get from doing like side quests and stuff are these things called sparks, which are like, you know, Rosalina stars, but mixed with rabbits. And yeah. they're kind of like... They'll give you like pretty significant, like you equip them on characters. You can even level them up and they'll give you like passives, but yeah, also like active abilities. Cool. And that can like pretty dramatically change depending on who you equip them on and the skills you're using. I mean, they just feel like really powerful accessories, honestly. But I roll around with Peach because she has a shotgun, right? But I also have a, a, a spark Peach on her that, that gives her default attack, like the burn effect. Which, when they're on fire, they take a little bit extra damage, but then they run around like crazy. They run out of cover, right? But since she has a shotgun, I can bl- do a very wide blast um, to not a ton of damage, but a wide But I can hit like five enemies or like four enemies. Then they all start running around, hitting other enemies, setting them on fire. Then all of a sudden, everyone's like flushed out of cover. And then, of course, Mario and Luigi, they're in Overwatch with their guns and you know Luigi with the sniper rifle. So when people are flushed out of cover, they're like picking them off and stuff. And I'm like, all that came from this fire spark that I equipped on Peach because she has an area of effect weapon. And I'm like, well, that's cool. I mean, it's not quite a build, but it was satisfying, you know, it's knowing so now. It's still charming. Should... It's still so charming that they found... Like, I don't know. It is. It is charming. But you know what would be cool? Like, you know, Midna being a sniper, you know, like, come on. They should get crazy. Give us another crossover. Damn it. I mean, that would be so cool. This is this feels like there's some new ideas here. But again, adding Bowser and a a new rabbit, that's just not not quite enough. They could they could have done more with that part like that. That part doesn't seem like the kind of thing that is what is going to you know, I take up so much time all. over five years. I feel like that's the kind of thing where you just got to... Uh. I also wouldn't be surprised if Nintendo is maybe... Like, maybe, like, I have a feeling maybe yeah. they pitched ideas like like that, like doing a Zelda or a Metroid crossover, and, and they were like, no, we gave you Mario, and we let you do Mario games, but, like, maybe... Like maybe I believe that. No more. I believe that. I believe that. One, one like, final thing, and I'm wrapping up now because we got to go, is is there's a little 
the loading is a little iffy, you know, especially because mm. now that you're exploring the world, you're going in and out of places, you're getting into random encounters, you're just pulling up your menu, just pulling up your menu, which you go into a lot because there's a lot of these RPG systems and stuff, a lot of characters, a lot of skill trees, a lot of sparks, you know, there's loading there and it just feels like, hurry the fuck up. You know, I want this on PC or on my Steam Deck or something. So it's like snappy and this feels like so not snappy enough. And, you know, it's not such a distractor but when they're trying to kind of speed up these encounters and stuff you know it's like you notice it more and it's like ah fuck i hate this shit right i I just want i especially i feel like loading going into menus is like a massive like don't you need to figure that shit out like it's one thing you know loading battles and houses and stuff but like getting into your menu that you need to access a lot needs to be fucking snappy or it's this shit is whack I think, yeah, that's I think why I you brought something pl- up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. No, I, no, I was going to say, I think I brought something up similar to that, and I kind of got poo-pooed on. Uh, but I, I, I want to I say it was one of the Assassin's Creed games uh, back in the day that it took like a second and a half to open the menu every yeah, time no, no, that's you needed to open that was, it. Uh, fuck, which one was it? Was that Origins? No. I think it, uh, maybe. I can't remember. But I remember yeah, that being maybe. like a huge deal. And like, Neither. it's one of those things where it's like, oh, I have to go into a menu to interact with something. It takes a second and a half and I come out of that menu and I'm doing I think something it was like, specifically the map. Map. maybe, yeah, it might've been the map or something. But yeah, I just remember one of those things where it's like, it takes it, that, that. Yeah, I agree with you, Brad, that like it, it, menus should never take more than like quarter of a second to pull up. It should that be should, super snappy. That should be a priority on every project, period. I think <laughs> so. I think so. Yeah, it affects okay. game fill in a big way. You know, menu right. feel is almost just as important as character feel, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, show. Um, all right, cool. So that's Mario Bros. Rabbids. I want to sh- I want to throw it over to to, to, to Nolan here. Uh, you have a game that you were playing right before we started streaming tonight. I was. Um, you were talking to yourself, which now I'm like... No, I was streaming in our Discord chat. Oh, is that what you were doing? I was like, yes. is, does Nolan just talk to him? Like, we're sitting here getting ready for the podcast. I'm playing Nightmare of Decay. No one's playing Bones Cafe, and he's sitting here talking to himself, asking questions. I was like, "Is this just what Nolan does when he t- when he plays games by himself? He just sits in a room by himself and just like asks himself questions." Motherfucker was streaming in our Discord. It makes so much more sense. Sorry, go ahead. You've been playing Bones Cafe. I have. Uh, so uh, Bones Cafe, a uh, little indie game, uh, just released this year. It's technically in early access still, uh, being developed by two people, um, a husband and wife. Um, I forget oh. the name of their studio. Something but an owl. Uh, Bones Cafe developer. Um, chat. Pardon? Maybe maybe chat can dig that up for you. While yeah, you're, uh... maybe they can pull that up. Uh, Acute Owl Studio. Sorry to me. A second. Oh, that's, that's a um, cute name. <laughs> yeah, Acute. Um, so anyway, Bones Cafe. Uh, the story is you are a failed necromancer. Uh, you failed out of necromancy school, um, and so you decided to open a cafe um, to to it. to get by. Uh, the problem is um, ingredients are hard to come by, um, and so while you can easily get produce, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, potatoes, stuff like that, um, a little more difficult to get, you know, fish or meat or cheese. Um, so, uh, you can attract customers into your store, your cafe, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe get rid of them in the back real quick. Uh, and all of a sudden you have some, uh, fish fillets you can serve. This is um, dark. Uh-huh. <laughs> then the game gets pretty complicated. It gets pretty busy. You know, your cafe is growing. You can't do everything by yourself. Customers are getting mad. They're leaving. You, um, you... well, what's up, Chris? I mean, I was just going to say, like, in a game where you're you're growing your audience, you can't operate on a skeleton crew. You need to hire more people. Oh, my God. <laughs> Damn, that um, was Nolan levels of yeah. that joke. That's pretty good. So what, what you that, can man? do is you can use the souls of the people you've previously uh, poisoned, um, and you can use your necromancy skills to summon them as helpers in your cafe. Um, and so. Um, you create automation essentially using them. So you essentially summon a skeleton and you say, here's your task. You're going to pick up lettuce. You're going to put it on this board. You're going to chop it and you're going to put it on the counter behind you. And that's all you do. And they will just keep doing that over and over. Obviously, if there's already something in that spot, they can't do it. So they'll kind of go into a holding period 
or a holding pattern. Uh, then you can have another skeleton who will maybe chop a tomato and combine it with that lettuce and then put it on a plate. And now there's a, a ready salad. Uh, and so early on, it started very simple. You just maybe have a chef or, you know, you make the skeleton become a chef and just do one simple task for you. But this starts getting more complicated and more complicated. Um, I have some footage. I, I try to splice this footage out. So later on, you'll see um, that I have like, I want to say like maybe 12 or 13 uh, helpers going on at once. And you can get, you know, I want to say upwards of 50. Like you can, it can get insane. I mean, obviously not in that map we're looking at right now, right? No, correct. So yeah, so um, and actually even uh, later on in this footage, I think as I was recording this, I, I upgraded my cafe because I, there is a kind of a story mode to this. Um, you know, your cafe is growing. You're getting the whole point is you want to a earn money, b serve x number of customers, um, which leads to uh, getting good reputation for your cafe. So the thing is, it, people come in, they enjoy the food, they leave. They yeah, it's good word of mouth. Uh, people come in, they see you murdering someone, um, they leave and they're like, hey, don't go there. And so there's this constant kind of ebb and flow of you want to kill customers to get ingredients, um, but you don't want other customers to, see, customers to see because then you don't get that reputation. Um, and also, obviously, if someone dies, they don't add to the, your reputation. Um, so so are there like negative consequences for like uh, too many customers having you know, bad opinions yes. of you. Like, do people, yeah. did the police come in and have a bone to pick with you or something? Oh, my God. Very forced. Um, no. Um, so, as I was saying, um, you can see in this case that I had, uh, I failed some orders and uh, some customers saw uh, me murder someone, so I had negative reputation. But thankfully, I served enough, well enough, um, to uh, um, get positive net reputation. Um as, as your restaurant grows, like I said, you'll unlock new recipes. There's 95 recipes in this game Damn. Um, of, of varying complexity, uh, starting from, you know, you know, lettuce and tomato becoming a salad to, uh, oh, now all of a sudden you're making fried uh, tomatoes. So you have to chop them up and then flour them and then deep fry them. Um, and it gets more and more complex in some you start like having to, to interact with like 15 different tools in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, in, in the footage right now, there's some of the, the story going on where, you know, oh, you know, at some point someone calls and they're like, hey, restaurant, you know, I'm from you know, such and such. And I see that you're growing. And so we're going to send the health inspector over uh, to look at your restaurant. And then like a couple <laughs> of days in the game later, uh, they call back and they're like, hey, so, you know, the, uh, the health inspector, health is- we sent him over, but he never came back. Um, so, you know, you're <laughs> off the hook for now. Um, and then the, the character, uh, bones, he makes a comment like, Oh, I guess maybe they're in the fridge now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like I said, it gets more and more complex. Your restaurant gets larger and larger, and then you have to actually keep up with that. So you can't just be making a salad, um, because people are going to be like, what, what is this giant restaurant that just serves crappy salads? So you actually have to keep upping uh, the complexity of your menu, uh, to keep up with that. Now, granted, you can have a day where you have a super simple menu. It's just you don't earn any reputation. The game even tells you, it's like, hey, you know, you can go ahead with this menu, uh, which I've had to do a couple of times because, you know, uh, I'm running low on fish. Well, I can't have a day where, like, I'm trying to murder a bunch of, like, amphibians to get the fish from them. So I'll just have a day where it's like, hey, you know what? Today, just salad. I'm not going to earn any reputation, uh, but I'm going to get a lot of amphibians to come in or fish or, you know, I guess they're kind of fish creatures. Uh, so I can... Uh, I do think it's in- mm-hmm. integral for like people listening at home who may be struggling to picture this. If you're if you're if your brain is immediately kind of like gravitating towards overcooked, that's pretty accurate. Like this no, does. Yeah, I, mean, I would it's, say it's, it's 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 very overcooked. Um, kind of meets played up is another very popular mm. game going on right now uh, that a lot of people are playing. Um, uh, the you know, I would I would say they're very similar. But like I said, the whole shtick to this is you have to get your ingredients from somewhere. Um, and the, the main thing is your customers. To, uh, I also want to give points to technology in chat who said, these Karens all have to complain when they see one murder in the kitchen. And then he said, Scarens. Yep. Scarens. Like, like, mm-hmm. it's, um, yes. it's pretty good. Yeah. But <laughs> so, so I've been, I've been, I've been enjoying my time with it so far. I will say that there are multiple times where you do have a complete failure. Um, because it's like, hey, I'm going to try this and this, and you, you assign your skeletons a bunch of tasks, and it just completely gets fucked. So, I mean, so it's very dangerous. Uh, hmm? Sorry, sorry. Maybe, maybe I missed that part of, part of the conversation, but 
you're like kind of setting like their like brief AI routine yourself. Correct. And you'll you'll see if you if you see the footage you're also just the did, of the restaurant, it looks like. Well, yeah, so and, and so that's what happened was so I'm on a new day and I've decided some new menu I- items. Well, the previous layout of the restaurant completely does not work for those menu items. So almost not daily, it's just whenever you're switching stuff up, you end up kind of redesigning the restaurant. So it's now, like a factorio the game, kind of thing or whatever. Exactly, right? yeah, very much like Factorio. Mm-hmm. Um um you can save the layout, thankfully. So if you like one, you can actually save it as a preference and then reload it. Uh, but in this case, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to be making salad, uh, mozzarella sticks, uh, chicken fried steak, baked potato, all this different stuff. So oh, I need to have a hungry. bunch of different sections. Yeah. Um, so like I said, it can be dangerous though, because if you do something wrong, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to have this guy bread the fish and put it in the fryer and bread the fish and put it in the fire over and over again. Well, if the guy that I assigned to take the fish out of the fryer gets held up for some reason, well, now I have uh, a burnt fish in the fryer and I can't put anything else in there. So it's it's a lot of kind of trial and error early on until you get into this rhythm where all of a sudden, to almost an extent, the game can play itself. Now, granted, you know, the, the NPCs won't kill customers. So if you're starting to run low on something, you kind of need to do it. Um, but, you know... I, I've seen that my highest combo in a day is like a hundred or 200, maybe customer served. I saw there's an achievement for serving like a thousand customers in a day, um, which goes by pretty quick. How many um, people and so do you, you have, have to kill to, to serve a thousand people in a day? So it depends on what you're serving. Um, you know, we'll, 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 you, if you kind of lean, I think there's even an achievement in this game uh, for doing an entire run of the game uh, as a vegan. Um, so <laughs> not using any like people like, so it's all like the different vegetable stuff. Um, you know, you, but you can do like a, a cake or something like that. I don't know if there's egg and cake uh, that might not be vegan. But anyway, um, there's there's a lot of different stuff you can do. Um, and it, there's like a test kitchen mode where you can kind of shut down for the day to try out new recipes. And that's what I was doing when I was talking to myself mm. uh, before the podcast was the game will tell you what a recipe is like. It'll tell you, oh, um, you know, it is a uh, flour, cheese chopping board and the fryer but it doesn't tell you what you're making and so you kind of have to figure it out on your own um that oh if i chop the cheese and then combine it with flour and then put it in the deep fryer and then when it comes out oh it's a mozzarella stick um and so you have to kind of figure those out but like i said once they start getting more and more complicated and you're using a mixer a pot with with boiling water a chopping board and four different ingredients you're okay what's the order of operations here you have to figure that out and then now i also need to remember that because i'm going to be assigning one of my skeletons to do it for me and so i have to make sure i do think and so it, it, it gets super complicated the later on you go um and so it's it's been a lot of fun i've cool. been really enjoying it you'll you'll notice some, I think, someone who can't stand overcooked because I get too stressed out. This seems more like a thinking man's cooking game. <laughs> For sure. It, you know, it is, it is, I don't want to say it very much like Baba is you, but it is puzzles. It is, it is you, but you are creating the puzzle. You are yeah. saying, okay, I know what my outcome needs to be. You can do any number of things to get it there, but you, A, you need to do it efficiently because if mm. you're not, you know, creating food fast enough, your customers mm. might not be happy. Now, granted, like I can put, I can put a single table, in the restaurant and just only have to deal with a total of four customers at most, but you're not making enough money. You So the, 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 in the flow rate of customers is completely dependent on the number of tables you have set up. But multiple times I've been like way too yeah, full of myself and I put up too many tables and I just get fucked. Like people are constantly right. leaving and they're not getting their food on time. Um, and so, it's, it's, you know, it's, yeah. Um, so it's it's definitely an interesting thing. Uh, one of the things, like I said, you can murder customers and something that's very helpful is creating essentially like a murder corner. Um, because if someone's behind a counter when they die, um, no one notices. Um, and then you can put them on the chopping board and chop them. Unfortunately, when you go to pick them up, everyone can see. So you have to make sure people's backs are facing the other way. Um, so you wait until everyone's kind of looking away and eat, busy eating and you pick them up and you chop them real quick. Um, that's so but, fucked uh, up. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It, it, it's pretty fun. I've been, I've been really enjoying it. Um, there's a. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, th- I think this the, the what's going on in the footage now was I, I spent a long time setting up the restaurant, uh, got everything going. I start the day and they end up failing miserably. Um, the sh- things just go to shit, and I realize I didn't have good enough output, uh, and I had to end up changing because I, I had too many recipes going on. Uh, you know, there's just, oh, it, it gets so complicated. I think it's also one of those things where I was a little too ambitious 
in that, I think in this footage, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine workers, and that's it. Um, where I'm at in the game now, I think I'm up to 16 or 17. Uh, and so I could probably redo this with that many people and have a much better outcome because there's less waiting around. There's more people doing things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. I would, I would definitely Object. recommend checking it out. There, there's a free demo at least. So, you know, it's worth your time to just go check out that free demo. Wait, uh, it, was this featured as part of, uh, the steam, uh, what is it? What are they good screen? There's like a horror I, I don't, I, going on. Right I don't now. think it was. I just randomly came across it. Um, and was like, Hey, this game looks interesting. There's a free demo. Let me check it out. Any idea? Is it supposed to come out of early access soon, or is it like? Um, I don't know if it is. Um, like I said, it's just two people working on it, and I think they've so far spent ten months on it, um, and they've come a long way in like ten months, maybe a little it's more pretty, than that now. It's pretty um, cool. It's cute. I like yeah. it. Hey Nick, what's up? Can I have three minutes to talk about a game I've been playing a lot of? Slice, slice, and dice. Slice and dice, yeah. Sure. I, want, I, I was going to talk about this last week when I really had nothing new to bring, but it was the thing I was playing on my phone. I was looking for a game to kind of replace or temporarily replace Into the Breach because I'm playing phone games now for reasons, you know, poop reasons and stuff. Poop um, reasons. And I really wanted to, to talk about it briefly on the show and show it off because it is a... RPG roguelike thing for mobile phones. I think it's also on itch.io, uh, but there's no trailers for this game. You, I can't like drop a trailer in discord and say, Hey, look at this game. Doesn't it look cool? Go play it. It's there's no trailer. It, it's, it's not big enough for trailers, but it is on a phone. I heard about it on some other podcasts and I was like, Oh, that sounds like something I like. And sure enough, I like it quite a bit. It is a roguelike game. RPG game where um, all of you, you have all these different characters in your party and there's like I think like a hundred job classes in this game that you could unlock by completing various challenges and, but every every character in your party, this is very like board gaming, like modern board game, but, but every character in your party is like assigned a dice and like every one of those die have like various like abilities that that class would do. And you know, you, you, you have three roles basically. And, and kind of like, again, like that modern dice game, right. Where you're, you're kind of deciding like, uh, ah, should I give it an extra role? Because my, my, this attack, you know, for this turn could be better if I push it and maybe risk rolling. But, but you know, you, you can land on an X or whatever, or land on something that wasn't as good as the last turn. That's the whole point of, you know, holding your dice versus rolling again. Right. Um, and the cool thing is there's all these different job classes and there's all these different like items, like the loot and stuff, like, well, the way it modifies like your die, which could dramatically change the way a class plays is like so cool. Like, I feel like they're never running out of cool class ideas and dice ideas and ways to like modify those dice in like really cool ways. And same with like the enemy designs. They keep coming up with like cool new enemy designs. And it's just, it's just been a really addictive game if you like you know rpg class systems co combat systems and like dice games and you know the whole concept of of you know going for that extra role you know the gambling like if you will with, with your turn it's just I like it's, how it's, it like it, renders the like the actual animation of the dice rolling yeah through. and there's actual like <laughs> physics to it believe it or not um yeah. and like just the the interface is like smart the ui is like is like smart it's snappy it feels good to play there's no music in this game but you do hear all your dice rolls and your attacks because it, it's the kind of game where you're like listening to a podcast or your music on your phone while you're playing it or whatever or not listening to it at all right um, and it's just, it's, it's like a really good addictive mobile game that is really is. And I didn't think anyone, anything could fulfill the void of me not playing into the breach anymore on my phone, but this is doing a really good job and I recommend it. And I just wanted to show a little bit of footage because, you know, you can get it on your phone or because HIO and I guaranteed almost no other podcast out there. will talk about this. game. No, I no, that's not true. I heard about this really? from another podcast, but oh, I've never well, heard good. or seen anything about this game ever since that one podcast mentioned it. So, so then I downloaded podcasts will market this game and there's no actual honest to God marketing for this game um well you know i think it was an episode of the besties so if you if, if i didn't sell you here and, I, and i'm out of time uh go listen to a recent episode of the besties where they talk about this game because they sold me on it and i'm glad i tried it because 
it's really fun and it's addictive. And dice are cool, especially when you can like find cool ways to modify those dice. Are there any and, like dice with more yeah. than the normal like more sides? Like no, they're all six sided dice. But like like I was saying, you're getting cool equipment that like I'll give you one quick example. Like you might equip an item that actually swaps like the left side of your dice with like the middle side of your dice which is like okay well why do you do that but that's because you have another piece of equipment that you might attach on like some ring or something that actually takes whatever's on your the middle side of your die and puts that on like two other sides of your dice right so you're actually Mm -hmm. like like mixing and matching equipment to manipulate the sides of your die to give you like like really powerful maximum output like and it's it feels like random in a good way like you get in a roguelike where on this run is where i I made this crazy ass die with for for one of my job classes that i was just steamrolling through enemies until i got to a boss that that reflects all damage back at the attacker and i just completely lost the run but it it, that's what you want out of a good roguelike right is that randomization and and that and that those moments of feeling really really powerful and ha- having it all go to shit and there's just so much unlockable content and modes and stuff i again i don't know if anybody's heard of this game but i know you have phones everybody's got phones right um it's really cool and addictive and you know i don't recommend it to you or chris davis nick but nolan i think you'd really like it and i bet crispy would like it and a lot of people in chat would like it so download slice and dice i, I think it might be free to try but then it just has one flat payment that you can pay like five bucks. And then all of a sudden, like all those classes and stuff will unlock for you endless content. It, it's really, really cool. So slice and dice, you, you're you not going to be able to find a trailer. So if you're listening to an au- the audio no version players. of the podcast, you're either going to watch some <laughs> random YouTuber or you can watch our footage from the podcast. I, I was literally having to drop like YouTubers into our discord, having no idea. Like this dude could be racist for all I know. I don't know, but he is playing this game and there's no trailer. So if you want to see footage of this game, you're going to have to watch this potentially racist YouTuber or watch our, the VOD of our podcast. So yeah, that's uh, all. Yeah, there we go. That's a safer option. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to take a break now, guys. When we come back, like I said, we're going to do, uh, uh, we have one news topic I want to talk about there. They announced a remake of the original Witcher. I don't know how much we'll have to say about that, but I feel like it was worth mentioning. Um, is that true? And, uh, Who is yeah. they? Yeah, I guess we'll what? talk about okay. it. I was busy. Yeah, we'll today. talk about. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, but if, before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna like rattle off a bunch of horror games that I played this past week. Um, so and then we'll do the four player minute. So if you're watching us live or you're listening at home, don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this quick break. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, before we get into that news topic, we're going to talk about the Witcher One remake, uh, which was announced yesterday. But before we do that, I want to take a, a couple of minutes to uh, do a quick rapid fire set of impressions for um, the horror games that I featured on the stream this past week. Um, I streamed on Saturday from like 10 a.m. till about 6:30 or 7 or something like that, and I played. I lined up a whole bunch of horror games that have kind of been on my backlog or or, or or new releases or whatever that I've been curious to try or play more of. Uh, and uh, and then the other night before I played a, a Plague Tale um, on the stream, I played two demos uh, for new horror games that are coming out. Um, and here's here's what I didn't expect to happen from this. I went into this with the expectation of like, okay, I have all these horror games in my library. For the most part, I already owned most of them. And I was like, I'm going to play, I'm going to try out a bunch of horror games and we're going to kind of like, what do they, what do they call it? Separate the wheat from the chaff. Is that what it's called? Or it's like, okay, I'm going to cool. see which, like, which yeah. ones stick. Um, they all stuck. I want to play all of these fucking games. They're all great. And different for different reasons. <laughs> I, had no, I had no intention of playing all of these games, but now I'm like, now I'm like, I'm going to do it. I, I love all these games. Uh, or not love, but, you know, I'm I'm curious, at least, about all of these games. Enough to want to play them. So, I want to start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these kind of rapid fire, because, again, there was a lot. I I, I want to start with Love Sam. Chai Tai gifted me this game, and he's been talking about this game. Carlos has been championing this game again as well for a long time, and it's been one of those games that's always been recommended to me to play. And something really interesting happened. I played all the way through Love Sam on the feed. Chai Tai was like, 
you can beat this game in two hours. I was like, okay, I'll open the, I'll open this little marathon with Love Sam. I'll play it from start to finish, and then from there we'll do boom, 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 boom. We'll play a bunch of stuff. So I played all the way through Love Sam on Saturday. Come back to record footage for it on the podcast yesterday, uh, and part of the Steam horror thing or whatever that they're doing, I forgot what it's called. Um, the developer of this game, which came out years ago, like I think 2017 or something like that, uh, went back and remade the game. Or it, he says, quote unquote, remade. He basically released an update for it that re- that just changed, updated all of the assets, made the game look nicer. So like I'm recording footage for a game that I fin- I played all the way through like two days prior, and it looks totally different, <laughs> which is very strange. Um but kind of cool. So if you're if you played Love Sam and you're interested in it, like you can check it out now. It looks better. It looks nicer. Uh, the basically because the whole game takes place in one apartment, uh, and you're a character. Uh, it's a first person game. It's a character. You wake up and you're you read this diary on your diary on your 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 desk, and you're kind of piecing together the story um, about what what's going on with this character and the relationships. And he ends all of his diary injuries with Love Sam because his name is Sam or her. Yeah, his name is Sam. So, like, you spend this entire time reading these diaries, and as you read the diary entries, things start to happen in the apartment. There's spooky stuff happening. But the cool thing about this game, and the reason I know now why Chai Tai wanted me to play it so bad, was that, like, you don't know anything about this character at the beginning, and it is a roller coaster as you're trying to, as you're suddenly having these realizations about the character based on what you're reading and what's happening and you're piecing the thing together on your own, it, there's a lot of stuff that's not expressly told to you. It's just kind of like you're having these epiphany moments of like, wait a second, am I blank, blank, blank? You know, like, like what the fuck? And it just kind of changes your whole kind of like worldview of what's happening in the story. And it's really interesting for that. And by the time you get to the end, it's just, it's kind of a fascinating story and it's, it's two hours and it was a delight. So I'm really, really happy I played it. Uh, and I want to big, send a big shout out, of course, to Chai Tai and to Carlos for trying to get me to play this for so long. I know it took me a long time, but I finally did it. Uh, it's very cool. And I think it's, on, I think it's like two ninety nine on Steam or something like that. It's, it's cheap. Uh, and if you're looking for a quick, really cool horror game to play this Halloween, I do recommend going back and playing Love Sam. Um, all right. From there, Chris Davis, I don't know. Just pick one at random and I'll talk about it. Heartworm. Heartworm. This is actually one I played last night. This is one of the demos. Um, it is a it, it is an upcoming game, probably coming out next year, I would imagine, uh, that looks very much like an homage to the original Silent Hill. Uh, it is it is about a, a girl who, he, who, he, who is trying to research this house that is rumored to have a room in it that if you go into this room, you will be able to re connect with your dead loved ones and it and so she's 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 there's all these rumors on message message boards and so it's like a creepypasta thing it's like if you go to this house you'll shit will happen so you go to the house and you're trying to figure out what's going on um very cool it's cool because it like it plays with like it looks like classic silent hill it even has like tank controls like classic silent hill but you play it with but it feels a lot more con- comfortable play you're playing with analog sticks you're not having those like awkward movements with the d-pad and stuff it feels really nice um and your main means of like combat in the game is like a camera so it's kind of like a combination of like fatal frame and silent hill but the writing seems cool it has that really cool retro look to it from like ps1 era um this wasn't really on my radar until yesterday someone pointed it out to me on twitter and i played it and it is pretty great it's even got like the classic resident evil slash silent hill inventory system I am into it. There's so many uh, of these, though. They, dude, this is so, there's so many. There of are these. so many. People like, are obsessed with with homages to horror games of the, from that era. It's crazy, and some of them, a lot of them are good. But yeah, there is a I, lot of them. I think are, I think years ago that were actually like really bad. So it's nice to see some of them are starting to actually be pretty well made games. The thing <clears> that sticks out to me about this game uh, is the writing seems really like in the very short time i played it last night the demo like the writing in the demo got me really intrigued it's like i want to find out like you go into this house and you're trying to find a key to the attic and there's like a there's a door upstairs in the attic that has like it has like like there's light coming out of it and you're like i gotta get in this fucking room it's like glowing and you're like i gotta go in there and then you go in there and weird shit starts happening like i'm i'm into this and i'm and you're right there are a lot of these kinds of games um but I am so happy that there are 
indie developers making these games these days because they look and they feel and they play like this, but not because of technical limitations. It's an intentional, like, creative design choice. Um, as opposed to, like, a lot of these games that were made famous in the PS1 era were looked this way, felt this way, purely because that's that's how that's that was the limitations of the hardware. So like everything now is like you can have the look and the, the the mood and the feel of playing these retro games, but you can also make them play better and feel better because you can in, you can just inject little bits of modernism into the design because you have new tools at your disposal. It's really it's really quite cool and refreshing. Or A lot of my real most, stylish like Signalis, which came out today. Yes. Right? Came out today. I'm going to be talking about that next week. I'm so fucking jazzed for Signalis. Um, but anyways, next game, Chris Davis. In Sound Mind. In Sound Mind. I talked about this game a long time ago. It was part of the uh, Steam... Fe- we talked about this quite a bit. I, uh, we played a demo of it back in the day. Now the full game is out. It came out last year. Um, this is the one where you, like, you're holding up pieces of the broken mirror... You're walking around a haunted grocery store and there's this like ghost that's one, that doesn't like looking at herself in the mirror. So you have to like walk backwards and hold the hold the glass up and like try and catch a reflection to, to make her freak out and run away. Um, and I'm actually playing that part in the game right now. It's super it's this game is there's a lot of meat on the bones of this game. Um, and there's a lot of it has a really cool it's like atmosphere personality to it. And everything just feels really nice to, to control um and it's just doing a lot of really cool stuff mechanically speaking so like you're like scavenging yeah, all remember, over this grocery store trying to find i remember really liking the demo because i'm kind of yeah, like been anti walking sim horror games you know and yeah, this, this is not really felt that. like it had a lot of mechanics and stuff it has a lot of mechanics a lot of ideas at play and it has a lot of it does it has like a really cool use of like color in these otherwise really dark environments which i think adds some personality to it and there's this like weird, creepy, tall, lanky, pasty dude kind of like appearing and following you around this grocery store. I don't know, man. It's creepy. I like it a lot. I'm definitely going to finish this game. But this is one of the meatier ones. Like this one, I, I think I looked it up on how long to beat. It's like averaging like 14 hours or something like that. So this this is no like quick, you know, quick hit of a game. It's 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 there's a lot to it, um, but very much enjoying it. Um, next game. Luto. I told you this was going to be very rapid fire, so keep up. Keep up with me. This is the other game I played last night. Um, this is uh, this is very much in the same vein of the other kind of popular horror uh, genre these days. Very much in the same vein as P.T. and Visage and Madison. Um, and I know Brad doesn't like these kinds of games. I absolutely fucking adore them. The whole these These games are great because they're like giant escape rooms that are terrifying to explore because they're like photorealistic and they're doing some really crazy stuff. Um, the thing about this game that kind of sticks out to me is that like a lot of the, 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 the ghosts or whatever that you're kind of, that are kind of stalking you and haunting this place are actual like human figures wearing sheets. Um, but they're like really, I like that. I like they're like that. people I, under sheets that are just like, they have no eye holes. I think I remember the trailer for this. Like, it's like, I, okay. I remember the trailer. You know, oh, I love that. We, we talked. I talked about it in Discord, and you said you had seen the movie. But the movie uh, I, I saw, one of the movies I saw for this month for uh, you know Halloween times was uh-huh. the movie called Anything for Jackson. Yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. some ghosts in that movie as well. That and there's this one in particular that's a kid in a under a sheet. Yeah, uh, which was a pretty cool moment because then there's like a very tall guy under a sheet. And I was like, yeah. Oh, I love, I love <laughs> when the sheet ghost is actually pretty creepy. And and they do that. It, it, so this demo is interesting too, because it's, it's like, it's not a vertical slice of the actual game. It's a separate thing they built as kind of just to give you an idea of what to expect. So I don't think anything that happens or at least in this order or in this layout or whatever, this is not in the actual game. It's just pieces of the actual game pieced together to tell you to, to have you do something for a demo, for demo purposes, I mean. Um, but yeah, like, you run into these, these like, ghost people that are wearing sheets. And, like, the, the creepiest one, I was, up, I was like, wandering around upstairs trying to find this, like, item. And there's, like, a whole bunch of furniture that's covered in sheets and stuff. And there's a sheet on the ground. And I grabbed this item. And then I, I was like, oh, I got it. And I turn around. And when I turn around, the, the sheet on the ground stood up and then, like, crawled up the wall. 
Like, but but you're in this you're in this house. When you look up, it's just peering into blackness. Like you can't see the ceiling. It just goes up and it's just black. So this ghost like stood up and then skittered up the wall like a fucking spider into the darkness, but he's covered in a sheet. Hey, <clears throat> Nick. It's shit, this shit's I, cool. I, I know this is supposed to be really quick and you're about to move on, but is there any cool non-boring stuff in this footage? Uh, like she yeah, goes. it's kind of, it's, yeah, actually, <laughs> can you, I don't know if you're able to skip forward a little bit, Damn. Chris Davis. Yeah. I want to see I, something. Like, 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 go like 30 seconds forward. Yeah, well, actually, no, back up, back up, go back down. Sorry, we're doing this live. Because the no first watch. time you see it, right here, right here, look, are you watching? I'm uh, watching. I, when, I, when I go up these stairs, was the first time I saw one. Oh, yeah, that's good. I like yeah, that. There it is. Like Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> This so mechanically speaking, it's it seems very very similar to something like Visage or PT. So if you're not into those kinds of things, I could see why maybe it's not your cup of tea. But the but like the the actual stuff they're doing to like spook you is really cool, and I love it. I'm so excited for this game. Um, I really wish I could get like Malia to play a game like this because I the last thing I want to do is play a game like this. But I I want to watch somebody play it. I'd probably watch someone play. Yeah. Um. All right. Next game. Sorry, guys. Mother. I'm, I'm going to get to these. Okay, this game, recommended by Carlos. This is one of those. Here we go. Legit awesome. I'm going to go back. I'm, I'm going to do another stream um, this Sunday evening to play a lot of these games that I didn't get around to. or, or fin And I'm going to finish this game up because this is like a, another quick, like, two-hour uh, uh, game. And it is terrifying. But, like, in a really unexpected way. You play... Um, uh, a single, well, not a single. You play a mother with two kids. The father seemingly has passed away or committed suicide, and now you are trying to um, take care of your kids. But like you, you go to sleep every night, so you're, you're taking pills to kind of deal with like the trauma of going through obviously what you've gone through, and that, so you end up waking up in the middle of the night every night, and your kids are just like restless and they're up doing things in the middle of the night. So the game progresses, and you do stuff in the middle of the night, and your kids are like playing they're like let's play hide and seek and just like progressively weirder and weirder shit starts happening i was too um, i was too scared to play this one because I, I tried to play this one last year and i couldn't do it dude this this game is ooh, this game let me tell you too. when your kids <laughs> i've heard this from someone and it's so true it's like when your kids are able to like open doors you basically live in a haunted house now <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible oh my god wow that is single-handedly maybe the, the the strongest argument i've ever heard for not having children um uh, oh my god i never thought about it that way um but anyways yeah so this game really really cool but like the weird thing is you you walk around this house and you you do things different things every night and you have you're carrying around your cell phone and you're getting you're getting text messages from your therapist from friends that are checking in on you and there's you're getting messages from your dead husband's brother and he's like really obnoxious and he's saying horrible things to you like blaming you for like like she had a miscarriage at some point and this is the like this weird shit happening like your kids are talking to the seemingly talking to like the ghost of your unborn son because you had a miscarriage it's 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 just really weird but like your the brother is like texting you and like blaming you for having a miscarriage and just like it's just it's about emotional trauma and the pressures of you know dealing with the pressures in life and after something like this happens and trying to take care of your kids and keep them safe and it just escalates every single night um and i'm only, i'm only like halfway through it but like i'm so eager to get back to this game and i think everybody that was watching me was, was really really into this didn't really want me to stop but so i will be finishing this game on the feed on sunday night it's called mother all right next game <laughs> the final game Stories Untold. Stories Untold. This is only interesting. Uh, well, I mean, sorry. Saying it's only interesting is maybe not fair. It is interesting because this is this is developed by No Code, the studio Our that was announced whack, to be doing. Uh, oh. oh, yeah, the stream does What's look whack. Um, <laughs> Stories Untold is developed by No Code, which is the studio that did Observation and is more and is was announced to be doing the new Silent Hill game, Silent Hill Townfall. So I wanted to kind of see what. I mean, I played Observation, so I kind of know I am familiar with the studio, but I, this one was kind of a hole in their library. I haven't played it before. Um, and I've heard people really like this game, and I didn't know what to expect from it. What I didn't expect was how 
what kind of game it actually is. It's an anthology set. There's four chapters. Each one tells a different story, but all of them seem to be at least. I've only played. I played through chapter the first story on the feed. It took me like 30 minutes. It's very brief. There's three others I'm gonna do, um, but they're all very like interfacey. Like, like the first game you're. Um, you're on a computer and it's like playing an adventure game and like you control what happens by like typing random commands into the computer and it like appears on the screen. And then those things, if you type in the right things, things happen. And like you're in your like childhood home and you're typing and like, you're like the person goes up the stairs and there's someone in the bedroom, but it's like, you're clearly alluding to you are in the bedroom. And now the person that you're controlling on the computer is like outside the door about to walk in on you playing the computer it's like it's weird but the whole, that whole first chapter is just interfacing with the game with the keyboard by typing things which was cool in and of itself the second chapter seems to be which i'm trying to figure out in this footage is kind of like you're doing weird experiments and you have to calibrate these machines by like turning knobs and switches and stuff and you're following these instructions on a computer so you're like going back and forth between the computer that gives you the instructions and the machine so you're like so like that seems to be how all these chapters are set up they're just very interfacey and and kind of telling interesting stories in unexpected ways um which i think is really cool in and of itself but also it it makes me think about like what a studio like this could do with silent hill i think observation was also kind of like that in a similar way like it's it tells a story in a very unexpected way um so i don't know between these two games now, I'm gonna go back and play, play the other ones because they seem pretty bite-sized. Um, and and that writing in that first game was was really cool. It was kind of like a creepy pasta thing. It was just like really unsettling, and you know, it doesn't give you any concrete answers, but it just makes you go, Ooh, like gives you the shivers. I like that stuff. Um, so I might, I'm probably gonna finish this off as well. But Nightmare yeah. of Decay. I, I know. I guess you don't oh, have yeah, footage, yeah. but are you? Enjoying I don't have it? footage of it. I am playing Nightmare of Decay. Brad, you talked about this on the podcast a few months ago. Um, and it's like a, the Resident Evil, um, homage to Resident Evil. It's like super Resident Evil. Uh, and I'm playing that really enjoying it, really fucking enjoying it. It's kind of like what I said about Heartworm and that it's, it's like, it feels very retro and throwbacky and homage but like there are little thing, little bits of like modernism peppered throughout it that make me go, Oh, this is like, like I'm playing this game that looks and feels like cla- like Resident Evil one. And then all of a sudden they introduce these enemies that are like running and like strafing and like shooting at you. They're like cultists yeah. and they're like, they're like strafing and like shooting at you and stuff. So all of a sudden you have to be like super precise with your gunplay. And I'm like, but like, it looks. It's like, it's like, it looks like Resident Evil one, but it became Resident Evil five all of a sudden. And you're yeah. like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's cool. But it's cool. It's and, charming. And the puzzles are, are satisfying and it has that like, you know, that, that survival horror, like find the keys and figure out the escape room aspect of it really well. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And it, I, th- I hear it's short enough that I'm probably just going to try and knock that out before I start Signalis. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. So there we go. I played a bunch of horror stuff. If you want to see me play more horror stuff, I would say tune in on Sunday night. I'll probably get started at like five 30 or five o'clock or some, some sometime around there and play a bunch of other stuff. I have some games I have lined up that I didn't even get to try last week as well so should be fun um all right now i'll sort of quickly talk about this news uh which i didn't realize brad wasn't even aware this happened um i i I, yeah i saw something in discord and i was like uh didn't click through yeah cd project red just randomly announced that they have officially started development on well sorry sorry, they haven't who's they yeah so did you find the studio name, Chris Davis? Yes, it's called Fool's Theory. Fool's Theory, uh, uh, which I believe is a new studio that's formed from a, a lot of industry veterans um, who have worked on major franchises like Fallout and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, they're they're a uh-huh. Polish developer. Um, the the CEO and co-founder uh, used to work at CD Projekt Red, uh, contributing okay, so to this... The Witcher Two and Three, um, as well as the design director. Um, this studio only has one lone game to their credit. Uh, it's called Seven The Days Long Gone. It's an isometric stealth game that evidently reviewed pretty oh. well. Um, but I've never heard of that. But that was 2017. Yeah. And since then, they also contributed to uh, a bunch of different games like uh, 
They worked on Hellblade. They worked on Divinity Original Sin 2 and Baldur's Gate 3. Um, and they also worked on Outriders. Gotcha. So they've been contributing to other projects, but not like they haven't. Ha- their name hasn't been so, the main developer. But what sorry, is the scope got- of this project? Well, I haven't really even said it out loud on the podcast. Oh. Let me just get that oh. out. So they, CD Projekt Red announced they're doing a full-blown remake of the original Witcher game. Um, and Fool's Theory is the studio that is going to be leading this. So uh, the scope of this, we don't know. We know nothing about this. It, it, we know it's yeah, going to be an Unreal Engine 5. Yeah, we yes. know it's Unreal Engine 5. So, um, it, it, the, so you think it's going to be like seem more like a modern Witcher game? Because, I mean, with the original Witcher's like fucking hold. Like when it, that came out, that was an isometric RPG. They eventually did the Enhanced Edition, which actually gave you they where they kind of like put the camera behind his shoulder sort of but i mean yeah. when that game originally came out it was like an isometric you know crpg and you know it was, if i, I had to guess this is gonna be more like the witcher 2 i don't see them going and making this like an open world witcher 3 type game sure but, i mean the witcher 1 is structured more like witcher 2 where you, you have these big open zones but then when you kind of move along with the story you you move along to the new area, but it, it's uh, why? Why are they doing this? Like, like the the problem with doing this is Witcher One is like it's like a pretty cool game, I guess, in terms of the story at the time. But it's like fan fiction. Like, oh. like it, it came out, it came out at the awkward time where where they were like avoiding all stuff from the books, basically. You know, there's like the Witcher one, there's no Unifer, there's no Siri, there's no like real mention of them because they were sort of off limits, I guess. And they had to like, and, and that's why like Triss sort of becomes like a stand in for Unifer because I guess they couldn't do Unifer or whatever. So it, it, it feels wrong <laughs> if you've like read the books. It, it just feels like a bunch of like fan fiction kind of. And, and do you, you think know, that they, they could take this opportunity to, to like, tweak the story to make it feel more no, integrated no you don't even need to it's not even about that because they didn't start telling that story till the witcher 3 you can't go back and like like those characters are so i mean like literally you know destiny you know like they're so integral to the the story of Geralt and and the witcher books that like not having them just seemed kind of weird and you can't just go back and reintroduce them. Yeah. Like you don't do that with a remake of the Witcher one. You have CD project red do that as like their next big Witcher project, which could be part of like what they're doing because well, they did announce a, a new Witcher trilogy and stuff. But like that stuff is it, that the, the the actual story of the books, which is what the pre, which is what sort of came before Witcher three, which is not what was in Witcher one and two, is like too good of a story to like shoehorn into remakes, right? That's when people say they want a Siri game, it's because Siri was doing all this crazy shit in the books, which wasn't really in the game and <clears throat> wasn't even part of the story of the Witcher one and two. So. I don't even know what I want from this remake. It's kind of cool that they're doing it, but it's like, so, it's not CD project red and CD project reds working on their own Witcher games. And I, I guess I would care more about those. Um, I mean, so, I don't even really like the Witcher one that much. So, so two things. Uh, first off, this game was actually already announced previously under the code name Canis Majoris. Um, I nobody knew what that was. Well, everyone assumed that that was the next full-on numbered Witcher game, not that it was an actual remake of the original mm-hmm. game. Um, and the second thing I would say is that because they they pitched this project as Fool's Theory is developing it, but CD Projekt Red has a very strong guiding hand on it, it sounds like this is another case of like what's happening with that secondary Sony studio with The Last of Us Part 1, where... CD Projekt Red is going to have a full, you know, grip on how the game is developed and where it goes. But this is a way for Fool's Theory to grow grow themselves out and become more uh yeah. become a stronger studio. And also I think that 
since this is an Unreal Engine 5 title, this sounds to me like CD Projekt Red is also going to use this as the foundation, both technology and gameplay, for the next Witcher trilogy. Yeah, I mean, there there is a number of reasons why a project like this might exist beyond the obvious of wanting to improve the original title. Um, and, yeah. and, and a lot of that might actually say a lot about future projects more than it says about past projects or, or, or I guess, I guess I would this. prefer for them to, it's weird though, because again, it's very like <clears throat> fan fiction is, is offensive. I get it. It's fucked up. But if you're using this as sort of like the springboard for like what's going forward, then obviously they would have to like hold up whatever the story is as like a pretty well, important. Well, I think he just means technologically. Like they're trying, they're using this well, as like, yeah, technological f- foundation for like. It, it, it's also a weird thing to just be at like a testing ground because, like, the remake of The Last of Us Part One was more like, you know, it it was little more than what it was kind of more like a blue point remake. Well, maybe not even to that extent, right? It 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 was it was polishing and kind of prettying up with new visuals, but. Yeah, it was it was less than like what say, you know, Blue Point did with like Demon Souls or whatever. The thing is, like remaking The Witcher One and making that feel modern that's like a that's like a huge task. Like The Witcher One is like fucked and old. You can't just put a co- nice coat of paint on that. It's like, that, it's like going from Resident yeah. Evil Two to Resident Evil Two remake. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and and that's not like a project for like a. You know, an experimental. I mean, like well, for I, a but new you also, studio. You also got to remember that the, <clears throat> the people that are leading this studio are not, are like, they're not like green developers. Like, they have been involved with major projects before. So I, yeah, I think it's I'm wondering good if this is going to be more like an isometric game. Still, not isometric, but I mean, like that seven game. If you look at that, that is kind of like an interesting, like isometric game. Um this wouldn't be isometric, but but I don't think it's gonna be like Witcher three. No, no, I don't know what no, this is. We don't, don't know anything about this, but I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Like, if nothing else, it's it's yeah. fascinating, and and it's not coming necessarily at the expense of like we know it's not going to be cutting into development time of the next major Witcher game or or whatever other major projects CD Projekt Red is working on because they're not the main, they're not the lead developer on it. I, so it's like I, I, I'll echo that, Nick, and that I think. Lots of remakes have been going on. Um, the Witcher one could definitely use it. <laughs> um, the, the Witcher two, I could boot that up and play it fine right now. Witcher one is rough. Yeah. Um, and with all the hype around Witcher, uh, with the TV show, um, I, th- I think it's it very beneficial for them to to kind of use that now and potentially time it with some future Witcher news as well. Um, so w- once again, I think I'll I'll go along with Nick and saying, hey, since this isn't taking any time away from CD Projects Red, CD Project Red's you know actual dev time, The Witcher Four ain't, they... ain't suffering because of this, you know. Yeah, no. And in fact, The Witcher Four is probably benefiting because again, this is going to be a, a, a testing ground for them to experiment with UE Five because up until now they've only been using the Red Engine. Yeah, you know they they need time and experience Man, to test I'm... this stuff out. I'll be honest, the most exciting thing about the Witcher 4 project to me is that it's not on the Red Engine. <laughs> like, holy crap. Okay, um, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap up the show with the four-player minute. Uh, Brad, would you care to start us off? Damn it. You know, last week, my four-player minute was going to be all about how, you know, through trailer talk. I did trailer talk the week before. And I was I was watching all these trailers, and part of that was like, oh, actually, there's a lot of like Bayonetta three footage I had not seen, preview footage stuff. And I started watching all of that, and I was like, my four player minute was like, y'all, like Bayonetta three actually looks really fucking good. And and I didn't think this when I saw that first trailer, or even the second trailer. I was like, ah, eh, this looks, I guess, okay. But I, I trust, you know, it's Bayonetta. It's going to be good. And it wasn't until I started seeing all that footage where I was like, no, I think this is good. This shit looks good. It looks crazy and it looks good. And now that doesn't mean much because the review embargo lifted and it's got, you know, amazing scores or whatever. So it's like, damn it. But I'm telling you, I saw it at the last minute and I knew it was going to be good. And yeah, I guess we know. So it's not as good as a four-player minute. So... <clears throat> 
I guess I just have this one little thing I wrote down, and that's that I've been really, really wanting to play Return to Monkey Island, which is weird because I hate point and click adventure games. I don't like point and click adventure games. I don't even. You're even wearing I'm a not, pirate hat. Yeah, I'm wearing a pirate hat. But I've been hearing pe- people talk about it, and they they seem very like fond of that experience, and like they seem to really, really like it. And is that on Game I Pass? don't. No, no, no. If it, no, if it was on Game Pass, I'd I'd, I'd play it or whatever, or make Malia play it or whatever. But it, it it's it, it made me think that I, even though I don't like point and click adventure games, I have a weird nostalgia for point and click adventure games because they're not the games that I played growing up, but they are the games that like a couple of my friends played growing up, and I have memories, like fond memories of like being at their houses and watching them play these games and them being really excited and really wanting to show me these games. So I have a lot of like this secondhand experience with a lot of classic adventure games from just like watching people play them and, you know, monkey Island as well. And it's just weird because, you know, I have this nostalgia for this thing that I don't actually like. And I don't know if y'all felt that for like for anything before, but, um, it's got me wanting to try this game and I know that's probably a bad idea and I wish it was on like game Pass because I don't really want to just buy this game that I'm probably not going to like, but, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately and I feel like it's probably eventually going to happen. And I don't know if it's going to like hit with me as you... much as it is. Like some people are getting quite like emotional about it, but they have like a much longer history. I have played through the original monkey Island. Um, when that it re- is one of those they games remade that it I am... on uh, remastered it for 360, but <clears throat> it, is, it is one of those games that I'm like tempted to, to buy, and I'm like kind of waiting for like any kind of sale on it at all. If a sale happens, I might buy it, which means it would be in my Steam library, which means you which is weird for you too, Nick, because I feel like you don't really have a history with point and click. I don't have a history, games. but like about you, but you have a history of like actively not liking them. I just don't have a history with them, so like I, I can yeah. go either way. Um, I have no idea, true. but it's also like you know punny and jokey. I mean, I, but it looks I charming. I, it looks charming. Yeah, I that's like true. Charm. That's that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah. So that's just my final thought. I just, I've been thinking a lot about that game, which is weird because I'm not like really attached to the series, and I hate the genre. But I feel like it's gonna happen. All right, fair enough. Uh, Chris Davis, your turn. Okay. Well, two things I want to mention. Uh, first. I know Nick has his big Halloween thing going on this Saturday. Sunday. But ahead of that, Sunday. tomorrow night, I'm going to be playing what? Sunday. <laughs> it's on Sunday. Sunday. Whatever. This weekend. <laughs> that's, that's within yes. the next 72 hours. My thing, tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, I will be playing through the Winter's expansion of Resident Evil Village. Uh, I want to play through the Rose Shadow of Rose content, and then I will... Uh, if there's, there's probably gonna be plenty of time left. Uh, I want to see if I can speed run really quickly through a uh, village in third person to check that out. So I'm going like, to do that the whole game. Yeah, y- dude, I've, I've beaten a game in under two and a half hours. A fuck. Okay. You know, sorry. This is neither here nor there. Keep going. Yeah, I, I beat, I beat village like five or six times, uh, including what on, the- uh, Including on uh, Nick, this is what Shadows true movie. Resident Evil fans do. You didn't know. <laughs> you, it's been like this since the original, man. Uh, fair yeah. enough. The, the 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 modern Resident Evil games have been really good about replayability and unlocks and things like that. So I, I enjoy playing you. through. I just, and... like, I just don't have time to replay those. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> but when... yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other conversation. I mean, I can finish the castle in less than half an hour, so... That's what she said. Sorry. I mm, Anyway. Uh, But my final thought was going to be a gigantic fuck you to Activision. Um, Two things this week. Uh, So, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the remake, but not a remake. No, 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 this is not a remake. This is just, they've rebooted the franchise, and this is a whole new... Thing. It it's, has, it's not a, it's not a remake of Modern Warfare 2 from back no. in the day. Two two things about it. Number one, it has a physical release, but the physical release has 70 megabytes of data on it. Megabytes, not gigabytes yeah. on a yeah, 100 saw, gigabyte disc. So you're basically downloading the entire fucking game 
I if, saw a headline that said the Modern Warfare 2 disc is a coaster. It's basically a coaster, yeah. Uh, that you're paying $70 for, by the way. Um, that's just fucking bullshit. But the other is that thing... on all platforms or just the Xbox? Uh, situation? Xbox and PS5. Wow, that's yeah. dumb. Uh, the other thing, though, is... Of, of course, Infinity Ward has to fuck it up somehow um and garner controversy and the in this the most delightful example of this um is have you heard about this ds slate thing briefly so there's there's a level where you're you're sneaking through a trailer park at night with mexican special forces hunting terrorists and uh you have to uh try to calm and keep the civilians uh from knowing that you're the there. situation yeah, and so some civilians will jump out of the trailers and be yelling at you, and you have to de-escalate the situation. And how do you do that? You aim your fucking gun at them. Yeah. Like... It seems tone deaf. What seems in a the fucking fuck? Seems a wee bit tone deaf. <laughs> That's oh. no surprise. Also, Activision came out and said something about... Or maybe this was a statement from infinity war that said something about there's one mission that seems awfully familiar like recent events or something um and they're like they, they came out and they're like modern warfare 2 campaign is not in any way shape or form reflective of current events and it's like well isn't this the game with no russian <laughs> uh, yeah. i mean well the original was this is not the same yeah. game yeah. oh it's no, like no, completely just, different yeah it is like the first the last modern warfare they made like modern, from a couple of years ago was not a remake of modern warfare from 2007 it, it was it well, was why just they a new game it because why it's marketable they're just, it's why? just like it's like when you it's like when you you like i don't know uh there's you know when they reboot a franchise and they just circle back around the to Tomb Raider. It. the yeah, franchise just, is call of duty <laughs> no the franchise is now modern warfare <laughs> No, it's yeah. not. <laughs> this run is it's uh, Modern Warfare stuff, but of course they're getting I, other it's... games. No, it, it literally makes no sense. It's like they're it's like they're 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 remaking uh, 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 Return of the King, the third Lord of the Rings book, <laughs> and it's like a completely different story. Like Modern Warfare is the fourth Call of Duty. You can't just take that word and make it something completely different. That's insane. Oh, you can, Brad. They did. It is insane, though. Uh, they just ran out of good ideas for naming some. They could have just as easily just named it. They they literally named it Modern Warfare so they can pick like they could just get all the people who like recognize that name and their ears perk up and they're like oh, Warfare. That's what they're going for. It's lazy. It's fucking lazy. Um, all right. Uh, you, no one. You also oh, sorry. open. <laughs> I just want the other. They're still discovering bullshit because the campaign has been in in an early release for everyone. Um, but. Because Infinity Ward has to be modern Infinity Ward, the one of the first missions in the game is you committing the real life assassination of that there Iranian general um, that uh, our government ordered executed several mo- several years ago. That's that's the thing I'm talking about, and that's that's where they responded, and they were like, "This is not this is not mimicking real life." And it's like, "Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Just don't deny it." That you made you made the mission. It's clearly it's clearly that thing. Don't don't pretend. Yeah. All right. Anyway, go um, ahead, Nolan. So big fuck you to Activision. Good job, uh, Nolan. Your turn. Um. Yeah. For my four player time in the shine spotlight. Um. I've been really into Pokemon Go lately. You know, I play it when I walk, uh, butters, or just kind of when I'm out and about. Certain certain events. Um, they actually now have like a Halloween event where like the maps change all this stuff. So it's kind of been getting me into it. I've been thinking about going back and revisiting Ar- Arceus because I never finished it. Um, and I know we have Scarlet and Violet coming out. Um, and so I'm probably for the first time in a very long time going to pick up like a brand new Pokemon game. I didn't get Arceus when it came out, um, but I'm, I'm I'm thinking about getting this new one. I'm getting pretty excited for it just because I'm kind of gotten gotten back into that mode of remembering back when i used to enjoy pokemon yeah i i dropped the main series for a very long time um but you know just all of the the stuff that's been going on with go has kind of got me back into it you know i'm talking with the community every day and in our discord at discord.gg slash four player um about pokemon and, and the stuff we're doing um and it's been a lot of fun i don't know if 
don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast the other day. There was like a big event going on in the game uh, with these elite raids um, that you could not do remotely. You had to do them in person, mm. um, which made them very difficult. You can't do them solo. Minimum is like five or six people. Minimum. You'd prefer yeah. more. Um, and I end up there's a, a Discord for Pokemon Go in Austin. Uh, with a bunch of people and it ended up like syncing up with some people meeting them at a local park um and doing it and that was a lot of fun you to kind randos of meet some... at a local park mm-hmm. Damn, and no. their ages ranged from seven to like 65 wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's... uh yeah no it, it, was, it was very nice there was like a family there that were saying oh yeah you know we played pokemon go and it came out and our kid was like three and now he's like seven and he's now playing it with us oh and all the this power stuff. of video and, games it's cute yeah no it was nice and you know some random lady like older woman walked up to us and she was like are y'all are y'all doing the raid here and i was like oh you're you're playing pokemon <laughs> i was like yes we are <laughs> and it, was, it was just it was a fun experience to kind of just see oh, those random it. people um, kind of coming out of their shells and then talking and you know, like I said in that one discord and chatting and stuff so it was nice alright uh, Brad just waved goodbye so I guess he's about to Bye, bounce Nick. I hope your four player minute's great it's gonna be great it starts now I hope Chris Davis is prepared for when he bounces out of this call um, it'll be in a second <laughs> so my four player minute starts now I just wanted to, to mention that today uh, I've been talking about this game briefly here and there uh, for a few months now, I've been very much looking forward to it, and it has slowly crept up and become one of my most anticipated games of the year. Signalis dropped today. I played a demo for this back uh, a few months ago, I guess. Um, it is that sci-fi, kind of like alien-inspired um, Resident Evil classic survival horror type game. Um, plays very much like traditional Resident Evil, but takes place in space. There's aliens. You like wake up on a ship, and you're trying to figure out what happened to the crew. Uh, and I've heard really good things. It's been reviewing really, really well, and I've just been, I've had my eye on it for so long, and it's just, like, all these things that speak to me, and I love it. Um, so yeah, I, I picked that up, like, immediately. So I'm ready to play that. Um, but lastly, I also want to mention, um, big fucking shocker dropped this morning. Um, do you remember the game Somerville? From the, from the, uh, the team, or from the developers that... Uh, worked on Limbo and Inside. Mm-hmm. They broke off, made a new studio, um, and they announced yeah. it. Like, War of the Worlds looking like... Family alien running from type. aliens. Yeah, mm-hmm. which looks, made us go, ooh, that looks really cool. It's been on my, like, ten, it's been on my, like, release schedule. I put it just, like, it's probably coming out sometime in 2023. We haven't heard about that in fucking ages. Turns out they drop a trailer for it today. Comes out fucking November 15th. I, what? You haven't said anything about the game in ages and now yeah. it's coming out in less than a month. I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy. It's coming, no, I'm very happy. I'm super excited to play the game. It's coming out on Game Pass, too, um, which is great. But, like, I'm super excited for that game. It comes out, like, days. I can't remember if it's days before. Day, I guess it's a few days after God of War. Um, blah, what? <laughs> it's just, oh, my God. I don't know what to think. Um, but I'm very excited. That game looks super cool. And, uh, I think it's, it's like sneaking, it's just sneaking in at the end of 2022 to like, maybe fuck up our worlds. I don't know. Could be great. I'm hoping it's like limbo and inside levels of, oh my God. Is there a third game that I'm, that team made that I'm forgetting some, I feel like there's one in between limbo oh. and inside or no, it's just I'm those two at least. Yeah. Okay. They, they um, have a third game in development. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. nobody really knows quiet. too much about that game, but I think Somerville has been kind of like unofficially like if you're into those games, make sure you keep your eye on this one because it looks very much kind of in the same vein. And like, I think that game could rock our worlds. Like, I don't I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling it might be a last minute like. Contender, I'm just going to I'm putting out, I have good feelings about this. I think the game could be dope as hell, um, just nice. was not expecting it. So, yeah, video games, man, it's crazy. It's getting wild out there. Um, And that is our show, everybody. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you for listening, if you're listening at home. Um, Remember, if you want to submit a question for us to talk about in our pre-show next week, make sure you get that in to Discord, patreon.com slash foreplayer, in the comments for this YouTube video, wherever you're listening, foreplayernetwork.com. I will scour all those things, and we'll pull them for for next week's pre-show. So get those in sooner rather than later. Um, also, make sure you tune in for upcoming streams. Chris Davis tomorrow with Resident Evil. I'll be live on Sunday with a bunch of horror games. Um, 
Could be cool. There's also a calendar. I put the calendar back up on the front page of fourplayernetwork.com. I know we don't stream as much as we used to outside of the podcast, um, but if there's ever anything that we are going to stream, I'm going to get it up there, and it's readily available, so check that out. And, um, of course, last but not least, join us in our Discord at discord.gg slash fourplayer. It's, it's where the community is, period. Uh, if you want to be a part of the community, it's free. Jump in there. We're active every day. Come hang out. Come talk about video games and movies and animals. We have a pets channel. That's a pretty great channel. If you like animals, pretty great channels. Um, if, if only no, certain well, members I love of our community your... would actually. Wait, say again? Uh, I was going to say, if only certain members of our staff would post more pictures of the pets in there. I know, I know, I know. Nolan, I fucking loved your Instagram. I, I'm, I don't know if you did this or Bernadette did this, but Kato, Bug Snacks. It was great. Oh, yeah. That Bug Snacks video one. was fabulous. <laughs> you can find those things and more at discord.gg slash four player. Check it out. Uh, in the meantime, guys. Oh, yeah. Also, last thing. I, I'm not sure 100% yet, but next week's podcast may be on Wednesday. We'll let everybody know. I'll update the calendar if that's what happens. But Crispy's going to talk about Gotham Knights. So, it's you know, a conversation going to be it's going to be good. <laughs> so anyways, uh, in the meantime, guys, take care of yourselves. Be good. Be nice to each other. Play video games. Go vote. We'll see. You next time. Go vote. Oh, my God. Fuck. Go vote. If you're if you're even thinking about not voting, go fuck yourself and then go vote. We love you. Yes. Good night. Bye. Bye.